Welcome in, Smite fans, to day number two of the Smite World Championship group stages. Some amazing Smite action yesterday and today and tomorrow and the next day. You've got Frog, you've got J-Mac bringing you all the action to start off this weekend. J-Mac, I asked Trelly this yesterday to start off the day. you got to tell me how you're feeling, right? Scale of 1 to 10. Trelly said 9 yesterday, so are you... Are you higher than that? Do you look like what's your energy Charlie, level? Tra hold on, Charlie started the week That's at what I a said. nine. He started at nine. Usually, you kind of start a little lower, and then kind of build up to the rest of the week. I'd say I'm like at like an eight point five right now, and that's just because it's the first set of the day. By the time we get to the end of the day, that's when I'm starting to hit that nine, nine point five, ten. We're 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 definitely getting there. <laughs> this event weekend. A lot of complicated matchups. We started with some of 3s and going to end on some of 5s We'll start with the teams, right? We've got eight teams coming into the weekend. Bottom four SPL teams and the top two SCC teams from each region. We split those into two groups. And from each of those groups, we're going to be sending two teams to Worlds. The weekend started out. We saw some best of threes yesterday. Going to have a best of three to start the day this today. And that will be our beginner best of three matches just to determine which teams go to the winner side of our groups, which teams go to the loser side of our groups. And then we have some elimination matchups to close out the day. That'll be the end of our best of threes. And then later on in the weekend, we've got best of five qualifying matchups where we get to send those teams to Worlds. And then, and then at the very end of the weekend, JMAC, we have our top four teams already at Worlds going to have the option to decide which teams of the ones that qualified this weekend that they want to face at Worlds, which admittedly is just as important a decision as the, the teams that are qualifying this weekend. So make sure that you stick around through the entirety of the weekend to see all of the great action. I would even say it might be even more important than just qualifying at that point because you think about it last year, Leviathans were the favored team kind of going into the World Championships. They picked the Tartarus Titans and then lost to them in the quarterfinals. So right. those decisions you make for who your opponent quarters is could come back to bite you if you're not careful about it. Yeah, there is a, a lot on the line this weekend. We got to start though with the teams qualifying. And to do that, we can take a look at the bracket starting over on the Group A side. These are the matches that we saw yesterday. So Highland Ravens taken down the Jabalba Storm 2-0 and then the Hex Mambo taking a 2-0 win versus the Gilded Gladiators. And that match, that elimination match of all the Storm Gilded Gladiators is a matchup we'll see later today. On the other side though, that's the matchup that's got the one we're gonna be starting off the day with. The Group B side of the bracket has the remaining four teams that we can see. We got to see Solar Scarabs take down the Camelot Kings yesterday in a 2-0. And then of course the matchup to start the day, the Eldritch Hounds versus the Kowloon Wardens. These teams still fighting. Nobody's going to get knocked out in this best of three, but it will be either put yourself on set point to go to Worlds or put yourself back up against the wall to go against the Camelot Kings later today. Yeah, so all matches today, best of three, the last two of them being elimination ones, meaning one team goes home and one team then awaits for their next opponent for that last chance to qualify up towards Worlds. And, and it's so important to get your best foot forward, especially in these first matchups here. Now having the SCC up technically 2-1 against the SPL is a big boon for the SCC teams out there and now kind of paints that extra target on, on the back here of the Elder Towns. And with what we've been seeing out of the Kallen Wardens, especially for the Wardens and how many roster change-ups they made over the course of their phase, whether that be their support role, their jungle, wherever it may have been that this team has made adjustments, it's been working well for them. And you got to remember that the Wardens going into their qualifiers, they weren't the number one seed. They weren't the number two seed. They weren't even the number three. This is, you know, number five, number six seed teams for SCC North America that qualified to this this world's qualifier chance. So this is a team that is kind of was seen as essentially an underdog going into their own qualifier and is now fighting up against one of the bottom seed SPL teams for a chance to try and qualify up towards Worlds. And the man right there on your screen, Elion, is one that is always loud in those communications. When we talk about player comps and something that we talked about during our recap last night if you go check that on youtube.com slash my pro there's a nice little shout there <laughs> one of the biggest key factors we talked about is communication with the teams being able to effectively and concisely communicate what you need to say saying hey this is up my dash is ready to tank the tower for two hits whatever it may be when you have someone like Elion on your team and when you have some of these star-studded players around you they're able to make those comps if we ever do a listen-in with this warden's team it will not be quiet. You will not hear silence on that team. It will be loud. There will be multiple people talking. And the one you're going to hear right out the gate is going to be their support player, Elyon. Yep. My only question that might come with this team 
is how do things change up when maybe some of Elyon's picks get taken away? Aphrodite and Maui were the two gods that he went to consistently during the qualifiers, and I wonder if those are going to be the same two that he goes to today, especially given that Aphrodite is being banned away pretty much by every team in the top three bans. So then that leaves the Maui. If the Maui eats a target ban, what's next up for him? And I think that's an important question to ask for Elyon and then for some of the players around him. I think that players like Slash who have had a bit of a role change themselves going over from solo into jungle has not had a nice and smooth transition there. Tuba has been fairly consistent over that ADC. But their mid laner, Nog, who, who has kind of jumped up into the league, has really surprised a lot of people. We saw them during the regular phase. We saw them during the qualifiers. We were saying this player's name quite a bit and for good reason. Yeah. He's a damn good player. Yeah, no, he, he has really been a pop-off player for this Warden's roster, I think, in particular. I honestly thought when, when we were looking at what the roster changes were going to come through in the season, I know Jangaro ended up getting picked up. I thought it might have been Nog, man. I, I thought that he was really next up on the plate, and we're, we're really tooting his horn here. That's because we got him standing by for an interview. Nog standing by with Gore. That's right. I've got Nog standing by. And the first thing I want to ask is actually about, I guess, a little over a month ago, around a month ago. Uh, you guys were coming in, what, fifth, sixth seed for, for the qualifiers to get here. And then we're able to have a, an excellent weekend. So, like, what were your thoughts on, on that and, and how the team shaped up? So, yeah. <laughs> uh, bro. I don't know, bro. It was, it was a tough one, but, but yeah, it was a good one. Yeah, man, you nailed it. <laughs> so, looking towards this weekend, right? Yeah, obviously, you know, you're coming in. You've got the Hounds here, but but also a pretty stacked group, right, with the, the Scarabs and the Kings as well. So what are your thoughts on, 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 you know, the other teams? Maybe on the other side of the bracket, not necessarily the Hounds just yet. No, they're all good teams. Mm, both groups. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Sometimes that's all you need to know. They're all good teams. Uh, specifically for your matchup, this set, right, going up against the Hounds. What kind of prep have you guys been doing? Like, since you qualified, was, was it like a complete grind? Or were you looking at, like, Hounds footage? How were you trying to prepare for, for this event? I haven't screamed at all because <laughs> I, I went back to Brazil and I was playing on ping. So, yeah, it was kind of bad. Well, hey, I guess that means we're all in for a surprise, right? <laughs> well, it sounds like it's going to be a little bit of fun. I'm excited to watch. I'm sure everyone at home is. So good luck in your games, man. Thanks for your time. And we'll go back to the desk. Nog, a man, a few words on the interview, but wise ones at that. Confidence coming in with the team, just knowing that there's good teams on the outside of bracket. I can count that for, for truth. Yep. Uh, and counting that maybe they're coming in to, to surprise. You know, they're, they're, they're ready for the meta. That being said, they've gotten to see a day worth of matches, and there's a lot of footage to review when you talk about the Eldritch Hounds. That's obviously a team that we've been seeing all season long. Haven't seen them in a couple of months, but the Hounds are a team that, they're, you know, they've been in the SPL for a while. You know these players. You know what they can do. But I think that's also an important point that we also brought up with teams like the Guild of Gladiators, who haven't played in almost, you know, 60 days seemingly at this point now. You know, it's all the way back in like November, almost October, the last time that we saw teams like the Gladiators and the Hounds. So we don't know what these guys have been sitting there and kind of brewing and waiting to see what kind of compositions they're doing, what kind of behind the scenes work that this team has really been working on. And, and I think for me, a lot of it comes to this guy on your screen right here, Oath. At the beginning of the year. Oath was the pilot for this team. This was the guy caring. He was the one going 9-1 and one in the games, making sure that the Hounds are being led to their victory. But ever since the roster change happened and kind of that midway point of the phase in the, in the year, we started seeing a little bit less of Oath. He wasn't as dominant as he was, and that naturally comes whenever you lose some of that synergy with your original roster. But having a double roster change, losing not only your support, who moves over to the Camelot Kings, but then losing your Hunter, going over to the Jade Dragons and Coast, Oath kind of lost one of those lanes where he could really play through initially because he didn't quite maybe know the synergy or the play style that he had over in that dual lane with Neil Moff and, and now with Stewart over there. And I think for me, Oath and that dual lane are, are the two factors of this team for the Elder Towns that I need to see the most improvement on in this tournament specifically. I think Ducky has been doing a fantastic job over in the solo lane, doing the best that he can given his situation. I think Benny Q has been a bit quiet compared to what we know out of the Benny Q. You know, we're not seeing you know, the Atlas mids of the day that we used to from him. We know we're not seeing the huge major pop-off games like we kind of grew used to in the earlier part of the year. But I think that's fine having him toned down a bit considering some of the areas around him. A new support, a jungler who's gone a little bit quieter. So I think if this dual lane can step up a little bit more, and if Oath can kind of get that fire back in him, this can be a really scary team to go against because Oath is prone to being one of those, I'm going to go 13-1, and one. I'm going to have 
you know, a quadra kill on Thanatos once if not twice a game style of player. And, and it wouldn't surprise me if we even see some of the gods like that. You look at the NASCC qualifiers, Thanatos was a pretty prevalent pick that a yep. lot of players were going towards with how strong Kepri was. It was maybe no surprise we were seeing a bit more, but also is just kind of that power farming god. But more than anything, I, I think for me, I want to see Stuart get active. And this is something that we've been saying about Stuart for almost ever. E even on his time at the Tartarus Titans, he was a little bit quiet at the beginning, then finally had that pop off during Worlds. But before then, and even after that point, Stewart's a very quiet player, and I feel like he is one that is very dependent on how his jungler is performing around him. If he can get a jungler to get over to that duel lane and start getting him kills early, get him a little bit of pressure relief, and more than anything, just get him comfortable, Stewart has the, the potential to be an absolute monster of a carry player. We just haven't got that opportunity to see it in such a long time. Yeah, I think all the players here on the, the side of the Hounds roster, right, we've been, we've been seeing a lot from them, and I, I'm... I don't know if you've been following the social media. I've been seeing a lot of posts. L. Chuckles' father, the the cartoonist, has actually been posting these They're pieces so of art. Sick. I've been so in love with the style and and the the love that they have for the team. I I'm personally a fan of the the ducky one because I watched the bear and that's a hilarious comparison between the actor that plays there. But of course, uh, you know all, all the support that the coach and and even you know the parents and the, the relatives, of course, that are given the hounds. We see it on the social media. So we'll throw up the art here, and it, it's uh, art by Harry Bruce. You see it right there. That's the coach, L. Chuckles. I don't know. I, I I love this stuff, man. I love seeing it on social media. When I saw the first cartoon, I said, "Oh, it's that time of year again. We get we get to see Harry, <laughs> we get to see Harry Bruce's work once more." I mean, he did. A, I think he did it last year, and it may have done it the year before as well. Uh, for Chuckles and his team, but man, all this artwork is just so gorgeous. Make sure you go follow him at Harry Bruce Tunes on Twitter or on X. So, I mean, it's just fantastic work. This is the level of work that I wish that I could achieve, but I do not have the time or patience these days to be able to do so. So I'm glad that there are other people way more talented in that regard than I am to, to be able to put out work like this. Smite's art community is crazy, man, isn't it? It's, it's insane. Everybody, Everybody's out there. We're here, though. Hounds versus... The other team that I have known, it's right behind. It's, it's because right behind. the Hounds is behind right. you. Callan Warden's behind you. Warden's behind me. That means that they're <laughs> first pick here in picks and mans. I mean, what kind of advantage? We've seen that sort of switch up throughout the weekend. Where are you favoring first pick versus second pick slot right now? Right now, I'm kind of leaning a bit more towards second pick. Yes, you can get a really strong pick in that first slot, and I think it's important to figure out what your first pick is going to be. But when we look at teams, I think it's like the Solar Scarabs or, or maybe it, w it was even that Hex Mambo team who was just running Hachimon first pick because they think that first pick's not as important as being, being able to get that second or third pick immediately after that one. So I, I think on the second pick side, it leans a little bit more in favor just because you're able to get two of these kind of top style of picks. But I think first pick has a lot of power because they can just kind of ban whatever right now, not necessarily saying that they can just throw their bans away, but they don't have to worry about banning what the top gods are. They don't have to ban away the Thoth. They don't have to ban the Athena or the Aphrodite. They can let the other team do that. That way, whatever kind of gets left over that they've really been wanting to go for, they can get in that first pick slot. And you see a bit of that reflected here. And I think it's wise on the Hounds specifically, not necessarily in just because of how strong Athena has been. I think she's worse than she was, but still good, just given how the nature of how much CDR is available to the gods on the map, whether it be getting the CDR totem uh, for your green buff or just building a lot of inherent CDR like Awesome Jake does whenever he plays gods like Charon. But Athena is always just going to be one of those relevant gods so long as I would say Geb is not a meta god. Athena will have some level of relevancy just because there's no immediate answer to that taunt except for beats. And sometimes you have to preemptively beats if you're not quick enough on there. And I think that the ban as well for the Thoth of the Elder Challenge is good just because of how strong that Nog has been on that god and just how strong that god is in general. But you still give over Kakulkin to the Wardens and that's also a god that Nog has been performing really well on. You've seen some of these expected bans, some more surprising. The Hachiman surprises maybe. You mentioned the Aphrodite as well, so that's going to be taken away. Elyon won't be able to go back to that support pick. But I mean, this first pick, Kukulkin, a couple of patches ago would have been really surprising, right? I mean, no CC immunity, no guaranteed here. dash or, or jump away in terms of the escape, but you bring a lot of that objective control. You, you now have the slow immunity on your two the entire time. But there's one I was going to mention that went unbanned through that pick and ban phase, not the Heimdallir. That maybe is surprising up at the top there, but the Maman Brigitte being picked in the top two for the Elder Towns. That is a, a strong start to the draft. Yeah, Heimdall is just that comfort pick more than anything. He's not the best hunter around. He's not the worst hunter around. He's very safe, but it's one that Stewart is comfortable on more than anything. So I like this selection for the Elder Towns. I think it might be a 
bit early to go for a Heimdall pick, considering what some other gods are Ishtar. that are at the top of the meta, such as the Ishtar or the Chernabog right now for the Hunter roll. But getting a top pick, Maman, is crucial for this team. And I think this is one that Oath can carry on. He was one of the players who was still going Al Kuang when Al Kuang wasn't even a, a thought in anybody's mind yep. earlier on in the year and really just earlier on in his career. And Maman kind of fits a similar level of play. It is another magical god in the Hunter, but or in the in the jungle role. So I think that this Maman could be a really powerful pick for Oath, but we've also seen that Maman has gone mid multiple times. We've seen players like Dardes kind of start to kind of pilot that one. Shinto as well over in the mid role. So I think that there is still some flexibility with this pick. And I think probably depending on some of the matchups that pop out, whether it be the jungle or the mid, might determine where we see this Elder Challenge team. So a lot of damage more than anything and a decent bit of safety with the Heimdall. So now frontline is probably the big call for, for what the Elder Challenge might want to go for. Offset side, Callum Wardens. The Maui's no surprise. That's yep. what Elyon was running. If it wasn't Aphrodite, it was Maui. That was pretty much his two in the qualifier, so I didn't imagine any kind of change there. The Charon is the one that still surprises me because for my money's worth, Charon is really not that great of a god. He's not bad, but if you use that tidal wave too early from that ultimate, that summon sticks wave, it can really turn the tide of a team fight. If you start a fight out and you hit two, three people, pull a set of beads, maybe force an ultimate because of it, that's a great start for your team. But if you don't have that, you just hope that you have enough CDR to keep spamming those silences, get those shields up, because the shields are the most potent part of his kit is being able to have those constantly stacking up shields with your carries, with your mid laner. But if you're not able to land those, and if that tidal wave is down, it really makes it hard for this god to kind of effectively frontline because he wants to be more of a bully than he does want to be a support. I like turn the tide of the team fight with the with the wave. Yeah, that's that's good stuff. Second wave of bands coming through here. Amaterasu and a wheelish taken off the board thus far. We got to look for Ducky's pick, I, I think. Heldridge Hound still waiting, obviously, on that solo pick, I think, for the second half of the draft. But Ducky was one of those players that continually went back to the Warriors and the Assassins even at the height of the mage solo meta. We saw him playing picks like the Amaterasu, like the Thor over there in that solo lane. So you gotta think especially with the mage solo nerfs potentially bring Warriors we've only seen Warriors in the solo lane this weekend thus far might give a little bit more strength and comfort to Ducky over there in the solo lane. I'll say I'm surprised it's taken this long to see an Amaterasu banned for that solo lane because of how good of a god she has been. I mean, a lot of players have been talking about how she's probably one of the better solo laners just at Blanket, but maybe depending on the team composition, you wouldn't want to give that one over to. She's great around objectives, Tiamat. but since she's banned, we don't have to talk too much about her. Instead, we can talk about Tiamat for BenEQ, a, a god that really does scale well to the late game, early game. Not so great. Decent jungle clear once you can kind of get at least your first three abilities online is able to really clear things out because that consume just is able to essentially execute a camp at lower HP so you don't have to fully kill it. But more than anything, it just brings a level of safety, some CC immunity in the ultimate as well when you are in that quadrupedal stance and the ability to kind of assist in split pushing when you can get those lizards online, allow them to start stacking up down one of the lanes, take a tower or two at that point, and just cause enough disruption and really, more than anything, late game safe poke and damage it is kind of the name of the game of this god where she doesn't have maybe the same level of poke and damage that a god like a Raijin might have or, or like a Thoth or somebody like that, but it's safe enough. She can fire it over a wall. It's got good range to it. So seeing how BenEQ kind of pilots this one, especially given how the mage meta has been where it's a bit more burst oriented, it's going to take a while for that one to get online. Opposite side, Thanatos and Nike picked up. We've been seeing bans and kind of signs of Nike this weekend, and I've been wondering when we're finally going to see that one. Jumping over into soul lane makes a lot of sense. She's got great CC. She's got great survivability more than anything. Drop that ultimate. Here's a 40% HP shield that you just get to walk around with, essentially, yeah. for the time being. But it does leave her susceptible to things like Cursed Ankh if there's too much sustain on one side of the team to remove shields. There's also Sunder. Do you want to dedicate an entire slot just to kill the shield for Nike? Doesn't feel great. But if there's no other options that you need, it can effectively kind of mitigate her there. And then, as mentioned earlier, Thanatos, which was on the rise for the NASCC for those junglers, a comfort pick. But also gets you to that, to, to that point again where 
Executes just mean that I don't have to kill you all the way, I just have to kill you most of the way, and then hope that I can hit the big AoE skill shot whenever I'm flying down from the sky to try and land that there. And I do trust the jungler to be able to land that one here on the side of the Kalen Warrens. I mean, this is a team that has proven that even though they were, you know, number five, number six seed coming into this one, that these are our players that really ha have it in them. I think that Slash making this role transition from solo to jungle has taken a little bit of time for him to adjust, but I trust that the Stannis has been considering this is one of the picks he was going towards towards the qualifiers. Yeah, he looked pretty good on this pick pretty consistently, right? I, I don't have any problem with him. And with the entire Warden's composition going back to their comfort, right? They get Nog on that Kukulkan pick right off the bat, just making sure he has comfort. And then in their rotator picks, their, their shot callers, you get Slash, you get Leon onto picks that they're comfortable with as well. On the other side, wrote that solo matchup rounds out, right? Nike, as you mentioned, haven't seen her this weekend, have seen her banned a couple of times, but the Wukong coming through, we've seen him a little bit. One of the solo laners, a little bit more prone to, to building damage, brings a little bit more pressure over there in that lane. I mean, if you're looking at at these drafts, specifically maybe the Wardens, they're, they're you know, the SCC team coming in, maybe it's on them to, to put the pressure on. Where do you think that they try to push the pressure early on in this game to, to get control? I would like to see maybe a little bit of pressure towards the duo lane more than anything for the Kalen Wardens. I think that Nike is a god that can hold her own in solo lane. Doesn't have an insane amount of kill pressure early once you start getting a few levels and maybe an item or two up. Maybe see a bit more there. Kukulkan, he's going to sit there and he's going to turtle farm in lane probably the entire time. So you don't even need to worry about mid lane. This Kukulkan, so long as he doesn't step beyond the halfway point of the lane, should be fine. I think it's the duo lane. Getting this Maui up and ahead, getting this Ishtar online is a very crucial part and making sure that you can also, you know, feed yourself as the jungler it is important for Slash. And, and I think more than anything that helps feed into how the late game will play through. If you can get a nice early game for Thanatos, yes, he's essentially going to kind of become an ult bot late game, but that ult gets better as you go in the game because you go from having a 20 some odd percent execute to a 40 percent hp execute and that's massive in late game especially with how much damage mages are doing now i mean we look yesterday said oh you know, here's a full build king arthur gets hit by a single tick of an ability it's 20 percent of his health down makes it a little bit easier when you have a 40 percent hp execute eyes on to the early game for the wardens and we're both these squads Kowlin wardens going up against the eldritch hounds ready for game number one and we'll throw it to the casters thanks so much frog and jmax and we goran trelly as we tackle this one with doug's help of course giving us the views and trelly i'm really excited because on one side uh, based on what we saw during the entire na scc qualifier run this is a team comp that the Wardens actually may have run exactly top to bottom that week and looked good with. And on the other side, we've got Maman, and I'm really just happy to see her again. You're a simple man, Gore. You yeah. see one side, I like the left <laughs> side, but then the right side, you're like, Maman, and that's all it takes. Yeah. And I can understand. I don't have the, to look beyond it. Right. The gameplay that Maman brings is new and exciting, number one, and also very difficult to lock her down. She's one of those characters where... She has so much DPS, but also she can, you know, take you down slowly. There's a lot of burst. And then, of course, the dash, which is just so difficult to try and outplay. If you're not ready for it, she can juke one of your abilities. Say, a Cuckoo Ult, for example. Just jump inside, come back out, and then kill you. It, it's very annoying to deal with. Oath, definitely one of the better, uh, you know, junglers at piloting this character as well in this tournament. So, should be a good look, no doubt about it. Just takes a little bit to get online. Doesn't really come out of the gate swinging the early stages of Maman aren't exactly the strongest. It does create, I think, like you said, an, an interesting dynamic, and, and much like the desk was saying, which is an early game for the Wardens, right? That's, that's more or less what we want to see. Especially with Slash on the Sanitos. We, we even had highlight reels coming into this event, or this set, and Delny's already a lot lower than maybe he would like to be. He's going to have to rely heavily on defense and health pots right now. But a lot of the highlights we saw for the Wardens were Slash getting triple kills on Thanatos just a, a few weeks ago. So really it is something I think that, that can be exciting to watch and, and I think is going to be maybe important for it. But a lot of it is going to depend on this early game. And, and so I guess the question is, is Thanatos enough? Which maybe you don't just need the Thanatos. I was going to also ask if the Kukul Khan is the right person to do it beside him. It might also be solo lane because these two can't just stop apparently. I mean, Slash has Blink. <laughs> Oath was looking very low. You can see, yeah, the solo laners. This is what the meta has become. Picking these ranged warriors and trying to get those warriors axe procs, right? It gives you that extra burst of damage, but it also gives you the little tick of healing. Both Ducky and Delny realize they can't go in, so they back up and they teleport. The health bars are just too low and the range is a bit ridiculous. 
Jungler split, both go left and right. Looks like Slash is going to grab the cooldown buff. Yeah, smart call. There's no way you want to fight over in duo when your duo lane is this low. Two Bun Aleon. They've got decent clear, mm -hmm. but they're going to back up when they realize that Oath could be nearby. Now, how do you feel? So, you know, J-Mac had mentioned that Leon had been going to Afro and the Maui a lot. Not a lot of people are going towards the Maui. A few more at least going towards the Afro. How do you feel about Maui right now? Like, is he in a spot where you're fine seeing it, or is that just kind of the case of all supports? I mean, I'm fine seeing it, and I know that you're a Maui enjoyer, so I'm going to tread lightly here. <laughs> Say it, what you need to. It's just that Maui is so hit or miss, and yeah. Leon's a confident player. He is going to hit more often than not, so if that's the case, there's no reason to not go towards him, but there are other supports that you don't have to stake your whole team fight on hoping you get a massive landfall, right? You, you just. True. You know, your mode just got the Riptides. Even if the ult doesn't collect value, you can find value elsewhere. In this case, Maui's got a hook and, an, and a landfall. Yep. You, you better be landing both of them or else you're going to lose a ton of value in that case. Realistically, Emoji's ult, like, that's a good example as a, a counterpoint because it's so big. Yep. It's so hard to mess up. Oath goes for an invade on the blue buff. Not successful this time around. Delny and Slash are able to defend. And at least ward off the Hounds for a little bit longer. About 300 gold, 400 gold for the Hounds. It's slowly been amassing over time. And they might be able to find a little more. You had mentioned it. Well, they've got good clear over in the duo lane. The health bars aren't necessarily looking too hot. So you have to be a little more careful. We're watching the junglers so far. Maman, as you had mentioned earlier, not known for the early game. I'm also really excited to see this just because... And this is something I think that has been talked about a lot. But Neil Ma especially around Worlds time, but really just in general, I've not met another player who is able to keep a mental fortitude oh, the yeah. way that Neil Ma can. <laughs> they could go down, they could lose this set, be down one in an elimination game later today, and Neil Ma will walk out of the booth and just be like, just got to win two, baby. Yep. <laughs> like that's, that's the way he views it. So to see what they've been able to do in the last couple of months, and specifically around what, what Neil is able to provide for this team now that they've got more experience with them, I'm excited to watch this duo lane and just watch the support everywhere for the Hounds. Yeah, 100% agree. Neil has been a ray of positivity for this team who has, you know, taken some some L's recently. Not necessarily in the gameplay, just, you know, the roster change that was forced upon them, things like that. I have liked what I've seen from the Eldridge Hounds as of recent, though. They should feel like a pretty superstar squad in this tournament. But so far, playing it slow, as sometimes you have to. When you're fearful of, you know, a Thanatos gank, when your duo lane is getting tremendous pressure, but also means you can't really gank when they're underneath their tower. They're playing this one slow, and I like to see that just because they probably are confident in their late game, right? A lot yeah. of the characters on the side of the Hounds are just going to get better with time. You don't mind Stuart getting full slotted here. Benny Q just wants some itemization. Uh -oh. Delany's getting low. Has that ultimate if he needs a shield, but Oath nearby as well. Yeah, I don't know if Oath is willing to dive the tier one. I guess Oath can answer that question for us, and the answer right now seems to be no. Instead, Waits for the cooldown buff, and maybe for Delny to make an oopsie. He has the blink, but it doesn't seem like Delny's going to be getting too aggressive here. And instead, it's just hanging back under the tower, healing up as best you can. Luckily, you've got Slash in the neighborhood, but is that going to be enough to defend your blue buff? This is where some of the issues will come into the equation. Maybe Slash instead will be the one in trouble. Good CC, doesn't make it into the sky. Oath drops the ult, gets the kill for first blood. Now you've got two deep in the jungle. Delny, who's half health, and Oath wants a little bit more. Forces the shield out of the Nike. Leon's rotated in, gets a stun but loses out on the blue buff. It's first blood, the invade successful, and a little over 1,000 gold now for the Hounds. Well, I, it was going to be close if that ultimate killed or not, but Oath had the damage to back it up, Slash needed to get up to the sky just a little bit sooner. And giving first blood to Maman, that's a scary Psychor. This is a character that can scale very quickly. She can start snowballing the second you give her a kill like this, especially with the first blood bounty. And already building into that Doom War means Oath's going to be farming quickly, running across the map, and using that influence just about everywhere, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's near Ducky more often than not, right? Delny's been getting the worst end of these trades. That blue buff has been a target of invade. It's not as if you need help over in duo. Stuart has been essentially pushed up to the tower line this whole game, so you don't need to head left. I'd be looking at Ducky, and unfortunately for Delny, you might need to buy some mana potions because you're not going to be getting that blue buff. And your farm game so far for the Hounds has been pretty solid. I mean, outside of just the, the pressure that we've seen, I mean, nothing crazy has been happening in mid, but you've got a little bit of a lead for Benny Q, right? And you had just mentioned it, but Stuart has more or less been running this lane uh, with a little help from Neil. So a lot of control on the Hound side. 
And Shelly, this is one of the, the most devastating, and you know, we've had this conversation several times, but this slow lead, if it continues on this pace, is one of the issues that SCC teams typically end up facing when they play against some of the SBL teams in tournaments like this. And that's the farm and trying to keep up with it. I mean, even moments like this where, you know, yeah, Delny, you're getting the, the smackdown onto Ducky. But you might be in trouble if you try to overstay your welcome. Oath spotted out, I believe, by a yeah, deep ward placed by Delny. So that's not going to be an easy rotation. Instead, maybe going for some mid camps might be in trouble yourself. <laughs> Only have Neil for backup. Yeah, instead they're going to pull away. But that's something the Wardens need to be a little more on top of is the farm game. And a lot of these cooldowns, I mean, even the, the mid camps, right, is going to be a huge example. Neil caught out, locked down, and killed off. Now uses the ult to burn him down. And there's just not much you can do about that one. Yeah, I mean, the Hounds showed their hand, right? When Oath throws his ultimate down to get mid camps, you can tell they're not looking to fight, which means if Neil's going to step up, great hook by El Leon, and of course, Nog just sends out the ultimate just to confirm the kill. That's going to be an easy answer back. As Delny's taking some damage, forced wow. the Sentinel of Zeus just to try and make it out. Ducky will not get the solo kill, but does get to proxy a wave, push one underneath the tower, and remember, there's no teleport for Delny. He's going to miss a lot, and right when the blue buff comes in, yeah, this Nike's going to be getting further and further behind. Now, one other thing I want to ask about the Nike, and it's mainly because sometimes I forget how oppressive that slow is, but watching how Ducky could barely yep. even keep up, he couldn't chase the minions down if he had wanted to. And so in moments like that, you know, looking at relics, we, you know, we've got a med, we've got some beads, the teleport, nothing too crazy. But do you expect to see, you know, something to deal with the shield, like the Sunder? Do you expect to see a sprint or anything like that? Or do you think they could maybe ignore Delny a little bit? I would hope that a Sunder still comes through just because it's a great relic regardless if you're using it to counter out Sentinel of Zeus. But it's not 100% necessary, I think, as long as you're playing around that shield and understand that, hey, we got to essentially kill Delny twice. It's not the end of the world. But you don't lose anything for just de destroying that ultimate, right? You already have a safety relic in the meditation. Ducky probably wants Blink, so it's going to be all on to Neoma, but Karan is one of the safer Guardians in the game anyways. You have so much movement, you have so much peel. You could definitely go for the Sunder, and I'd like to see it for sure. And Ducky has been getting the better into this trade through and through. We talked a little bit about it, and I, I can ask you now. Yeah, Jotun's Vigor, so immediately going for the Glyph upgrade, which oh, has yeah. been... That's the tech. Yesterday we saw some where they... they prolonged it at least a couple items but immediately going into it versus like the rune forge on the other side you seem to really like the Jotun's vigor yeah you go into warrior's axe you go right into Jotun's vigor you have extreme sustain right you, like the proc it's just so much more beneficial than soul eater because you get the damage you get the pen but the proc ends up being whenever you need it right when it comes up when you get that extra healing you just full heal off a wave essentially it makes you a little bit more susceptible to ganks but let's look at you know, who picked it up. When does Wukong, has, has Ducky ulted yet? No, he hasn't had to because Slash isn't over here. He's never in threshold of anything. He can just W key. He's got plenty of CDR. He's got plenty of sustain. This has been the tech in just about every ranked game you've played for the past, you know, two weeks or so because everyone just wants to be able to outpoke their opponent and sustain in lane and they don't have to stack up a hundred stack soul eater to do it. Don't tell me. They've been fighting over this. Last time Delny was able to steal away that cooldown buff. Now, though, it's just been this, right? Back to the warrior slap fights that we've known, except this Wukong's doing a lot more damage than Delny's been able to handle and has been forced under this tier one pretty often. Blue buff's coming back up, and you can see it. Oath, right-hand side of the map already making the rotation in. Delny half health. Ducky did his job with the poke. And now Oath wants a little bit more. Forces the ult out of Delny and gets the blue buff. Got a little hairy there for a moment, but Delny not able to turn around. They might even go for a little bit more. They have the minion wave. Do they have the damage? Knock up double from Delny, but the stun is good. The knock up from the ult of Oath is great. And then, of course, you get the Somersault Cloud. Everything you need for a kill, but the Hounds don't let it lie. They pick up the Gold Fury, secure it with Nog's ultimate, set themselves up for some success. The Eldritch Hound stole it away. Stuart got that. 45 no damage way. with the Horn. Yeah, that, that Cuckoo ult looked clean. I'm so sure of that. Yeah, 45 damage from the Galar Horn takes it away. The Warden said, you know what? And th this is a beautiful call because you look over at Blue Buff. in a row, by the way. That, that. 50, uh, like a 50 health objective. You, you, gotta, <laughs> yeah, you gotta be watching those cuckoo ults, <laughs> man. It was a smart call because what has Oath done? Clockwork. Every single time he's gonna be a blue buff. They're like, hey, we know where Maman's gonna be. We know where Wukong's gonna be. We pull the gold. We have cuckoo ult. 
But you, it's very thin margins, man. Any little mistake and you can drop it. Neil Ma comes in, sends out the ultimate, maybe disrupts that confirm a little bit. And then Stewart is able to pick it up. Beautiful play, and the Hounds just push their lead even further. Yeah, I was I was real ready to, to just give it to the Wardens and then start talking <laughs> about how, like, oh, hey, that's going to help eliminate some of the deficit. <laughs> They've been, like, that's, uh, my mind was immediately going on that track. Shelly, it's a uh, 3, 3,500 gold, just a little shy 3,500. And it doesn't seem like it's going to be getting too much easier for them. They need a win, and they need it somewhere. And if that Fury is taken away, maybe you can find it around the beacon. But it's going to be difficult. You've got all five hounds here ready, waiting, just looking for someone to make a mistake. Ducky's going to cancel out the stun before it connects onto Leon. Chase doesn't seem to be there too much. Instead, they're just going to conquer the beacon themselves. And now you're talking neutral objectives. You're talking kills, admittedly just the one extra. Diving towers, being able to steal gold furies and get the beacon. And the Hounds are putting themselves in a wide margin of success. Knock up for Oath onto Slash. Might want a little more. Stuart gets so much damage done onto the Thanatos. Now Oath just has to find a way in. The wave going to be a little bit too soon from Neil. And it seems like Tuba and the rest did just enough work to make sure that Slash is able to get out alive. Yeah, Oath was pretty close to Threshold, but had Blink, and that's not something you want to try and gamble with. Can you predict where the Blink goes? Is he even going to use the Blink? I, I can see why Slash didn't go up to the sky, especially as a level 11. Stuart, by Frost away, gets himself out of any sort of trouble. There's not much to do on the left side of the map. Once the Gold Fury's down, the Beacon's been confirmed. I, I like the aggression, but it didn't really seem that necessary. It was mostly just, you know, Ducky rotating over, trying to see if he can start anything with that pull in. But a quiet game so far, despite all the action over on right. A Pyromancer is available, and I still think the Wardens, I like where their head was at, right? Use this Cuckoo ult, use it to confirm your objectives. Just hover over the ability, it'll tell you how much it does, and then make sure you are consistent <laughs> and try and go for the Pyromancers again. That's your way to get back into this game. And uh, I don't think they should stop. A landfall off the mark there. A little bit of CC immunity beats used by Benny Q, and they have some aggression on the Leon in mid. Doesn't seem like the burn is quite there. Instead, it's Oath oh. who finds the burn. Oh my god, the damage done to Slash in the jungle, taken down completely by Oath. You were mentioning the Pyromancer. It's wide open now, and the Hounds are going to step up and take that. Yeah, they better. I mean, that Scythe, even if it connects, the heal would have certainly helped, but Oath, they, he smelled blood in the water. He went in for that solo kill, and he certainly found it. Who go a little bit late. The auto challenge are able to pick up that runic bomb, no problem this time. Ducky gets to grab it for himself. All the while, Oni Fury is going to be coming back up here, Gore. Teleport available for both of these solo laners, so expect them both to show up. Uh, I want to see it pulled almost immediately by the Hounds. They have this lead. There's no reason they should be scared. There is almost no one on the map that's a threat. Nog has some pretty solid damage, but the Cuckoo ult's down for a bit. I'm thinking the Hounds will play this one a little bit slower. Ducky doesn't have too much mana to his name. I assume he's sitting on a lot of gold. Yeah, 2k in hand. So would like to go back to base before that pull comes through. But they've got Executioner. I mean, Stewart has plenty of DPS. They should feel pretty confident about going in for the pull here. And this is something... So we've been seeing this, uh, I think, uh, recently. It's been a swap, right? Where a month ago, month and a half ago, we were definitely seeing crit towards the later end of the build, but right. Dominance was like the sixth item. Like, it was the extra, okay, I've got my two crit items, I've got, you know, XE plus Devos, now let's go for Dominance. And I'll ask you mid about it maybe in a second. A lot of damage for Benny Q in mid. It seems like they're going to back away here, and unless Nog has something absolutely insane in the pocket, probably not getting too aggressive. How do you feel about the Dominance, like, second item, you know, that both of the carries have gone for? Yeah, when Mages solo or the meta, crit, needed to be coming through. Now that the Warriors are back, I think Kinsai's Dominance are still part of the party. Oni Fury started up getting half health. Only Leon's close by, but here comes the rest of the squad. Yeah, he's going to be hanging out. Nog has the ultimate back available. Wave comes crashing through. Neil, oh, massive for it, but it's great from Slash in the back, helping to turn this around. Oh my god, they are dissecting the Hounds one by one. Finny Q, all you need is one more hit and the my Slash goodness. Scythe is going to be exactly what you need. Four gone in the blink of an eye, and the Wardens take a huge fight. I mean, the Hounds grouped up, they saw Neil's ult, they said, let's all follow the wave, and Nog said, uh, all four of them are following close into this little tight corridor? Sure, I'll send the Spear of the Nine Winds and hit four of them. That was a massive ult. 
And that's all you need for the comeback. Slash was able to pick up some kills. Look at that spike wow. in the gold and XP. That's what one cuckoo ult can do for you. That is ridiculous. Charlie, some, and you know what? I, I'm going <laughs> to say yesterday, Elu, the tides returned a little bit. I guess it was technically Gladiators I was thinking of, but they were at a Phoenix line, right? Similar lead. They were in control. And we have seen how one mistake can cost you. And that is, like you said, I mean, that's the whole lead. All of it. It's just gone. And what a fight from the Wardens. And, and so beautifully done as well. You had mentioned from Nog, but... Now the setup, now you've got to be a little more concerned if you're the Hounds. You can't just rely on, A, your team fight, but B, you can't rely on the lead that you've amassed up to this point. I can't believe it disappeared so quickly. Now we're 17 minutes in. Within, a th under 1,000 gold means nothing at this point. So yep. it is as even as you can get. Even experience-wise, you know, earlier we were talking about gaps, but it's not that bad. In fact, for, for a lot of the Wardens, it's actually gotten a little bit better. I've seen Nog hit levels slightly before Benny Q, much like right now, 18 to 17. Got a level lead for Leon. You, you've got Chuba, who's still in the conversation. Despite the pressure the Hounds had earlier, nothing's really gone their way. And now that that last fight ha has, has turned on its head, everything that was, quote unquote, the advantage has disappeared. Yeah, and that's the thing. You know, before the poll, I said they should feel confident, except for Nog. He's the one that was even with Benny Q, he's the one that had the DPS. Now the rest of the Wardens are catching up, right? Tuba, he's got some good DPS, finished that Demon Blade, is probably going into a bit more attack speed like he needs to try and get this Ishtar online. Eleon has a level lead over Neoma, so he's going to be a bit tankier, have that set up for the squad. Not bad at all. They need to play a little bit defensively for now because the grouping of the Eldritch Hounds is pretty strong at the moment. But actually, no, Tony's just going to jump in. Double knockup, then immediately gets a three-man slow. You need a little help. Pulls the beads, thanks to Leon. Up into the sky goes Slash. Not going to have the execute here. Wave from Neil Ma comes crashing down. Slash has gone to the wayside. Does not care about this one. Maybe it's going to be a Pyromancer. Look at You've got a huge grouping from both teams, but can you get the junglers involved and in, in, in time? Nog, little bit of poke done in mid. Seems like he's going to be just fine. The team loops around with Slash going all the way over towards the right. I don't think they're thinking about fighting anymore. I think that was Delny special. And they're going to back away, but you, like you said, you're kind of surprised, or at least I'm surprised, to see the Wardens playing as aggressive now. It might not be the 1v1. Oath might be getting baited in. Silence oh, now killed off Delny with the assist to Slash just decimating him. And then the house, the house got it again? <laughs> oh my god, somebody has got to get these cuckoos a little more on point I mean, with their objective. Nog can hit anything that's not an objective. Like it, Put four players in front of him, yeah, they're dead. Yeah, show, show him the team <laughs> of the Eldritch Hounds. He hits those. Show him a Pyromancer that doesn't move and tells you the health bar. It's going to be a little slow on that one, but it's okay because they were able to pick Oath. Ends up being a little worthwhile depending on how these Runic Bombs are used. Ducky's got one. Neil's got one. That's the big deal. If you group up on a Fire Giant and drop two Runic Bombs, that could be a good play. If you just go up to a Tier 1 Tower and drop the Runic Bombs, that could be a good play as well. The Bombs are more of an investment, right? You can use them to your heart's desire however you want to try and get some more gold in your pocket. But that doesn't bode well for the late game, right? If the Wardens do get in, in an aggressive position and they head towards this Fire Giant, Spear of the Nine wins needs to be on, mo on yeah. point. You've given the Hounds essentially the, the counter to it, right? Like I mean, like you said, you can just drop two Runic Bombs and you feel pretty secure about yep. the ab ability to take it away, even with Cuckoo Khan on the other side. So objective play for the Wardens. Maybe needs a little bit of a cleanup. That's the only thing that's given the Hounds uh, the slight advantage that they have right now. Otherwise, we're getting towards this late game. you got a kill lead for the Wardens. Beautifully played and executed over on right in terms of fight potential. Which is a little surprising. So, you know, Oath, on this Maman, as someone who has been mostly a permaban by, by everybody that's seen it, 3-2-0. and two, zero. Right now, Primal Fury is the main target. There's going to be the ult. And it's a little early, but the Wardens are still able to secure. Now can they get away? That's the big question for them. Good damage from Ducky. At least some poke on the way out. It doesn't seem like the Hounds are going to have too much unless they want to dive the Tier 1. We're 21 minutes in. They could easily do this if necessary. But you're going to be fighting up against four. Delny split pushing over on the right-hand side of the map. That's going to be a leap in. Neil Ma leading the way, but not quite enough to want to dive a Tier 2. Delny's teleported in, giving him the full 5-on-5. Five five. Instead, it's going to be a small reset 
for the Wardens and for the Hounds. I don't just want to go Maybe for a fire, fire giant here, but the Wardens, yeah, they were a little weak. Leon had to go back to base. Cuckoo ult not on the table. Fire giant's getting burned very slowly, not even half yet. But Delny blinks it anyways. Yeah, Delny there, surrounded now. Might have to use the ult just to get out. Massive slow, and the leap is going to be good, but now you need some backup. You need your team, and Nog is in trouble. You need to help him out as best you can, but Oath chases him down, kills him off, and gets the advantage for the Hounds. Up start now. Slash tries to make it into the sky, does so doesn't have an execute ready. Is he looking for a stun? No, he's looking to fall back and get out of here. You lose Delny in the process. Leon is low. Leon barely able to get out of this one, but with a two-man advantage to the Hounds, they're going to march right back towards the Fire Giant pit and start it up again. See, that's why you got to look at the enemy ADC's build. Stuart is not built for doing Fire Giant quickly. Delny blinks in way too early, and the rest of the team wasn't even ready yet. Slash couldn't find an execute. There was no DPS. Nog had no peel, even through double relics. They needed to stall for that Cuckoo ult, and it wasn't able to happen. The Elder Towns get the first Fire Giant of the game. And they're able to head on back and just try and get this lead rolling. It's been back and forth pretty consistently ever since that four-man Cuckoo ult at the Oni Fury. But now the Elder Towns are in the driver's seat. They're able to try and push through the last of these three Tier 2 towers and one Tier 1 over on right. So plenty of gold for them to try and grab for themselves. But let's talk about that siege. Ducky's been blinking in pretty consistently. That seems to be the engage. Neomas sends the wave. Besides that, it's not as if they have easy CC to just find a kill. It's not as if they have a Ymir Freeze or a Maui Pole or anything like that. It's going to be a lot of poke and all-in potential. But Oath is probably getting to that point where he can just 1v1 you, right? If you do a 4-1 split or a 3-2 split, Maman is here. She has arrived. She's level 20. And that's going to be a pretty big opening if he can find just anyone in the jungle, you know, sit around corners, find a nice stun. I'm going to keep my eyes on Maman for sure. Because Oath is getting to that point where he can just 1v1 essentially anyone he finds. Before he bought the tier 2, Neil Ma had maybe the most Neil Ma build I had seen, which is really just to say he had like two items, but fully upgraded relics, oh, yeah. fully upgraded, sort of like all in on let's get the team to where they need to be. And it's still pretty much exactly like that as it is. So it is exactly what you come to expect from the Hounds. Maybe a little bit of setup, and you had mentioned it, the wave from Neil Ma. Maybe a huge opener for them. I think Neil's getting Gem of Iso for the shields. He's like, you know what, I didn't get Sunder, but I'm going to get Gem of Iso. <laughs> it could be E Staff, that's like the obvious choice, but I think it's a Neil thing to do to grab Gem of Iso here just for the shielding. Not only that, I feel like there's a lot that you could do to... to Maybe, I guess at that point, you'd set it because aggressive, right? Yep. So that just lets you play a little more aggressive with your team. If you're all in already, all in a little harder, right? Just make sure that you can control it. I really do want to see a group up from the, the Wardens, though, and that's really the, the big thing. Now the Titans, they're running down mid. We're looking at a 5v5. How aggressive do you think the Wardens can be in this scenario? I mean, things were going so well for them after that fight around the Fury, and now it's gone right back to where it was before they got it. I don't think it hurts them too much to play defensive here. They are going to lose this Tier 2 tower to the Titan coming through if they aren't able to burn it down quickly. It's not as if they don't have DPS for it with Nog and Tuba. They can you know, try and shred it down, but it's all if the Outer Towns try to push. I guess the Primal Fury is spawning in. They feel more confident going in for that, but Neil's charging the ult. And he's going to send it forward. It clips two on its way through. Nog in a little bit of trouble. Watch Oath. He's looping around, going for the back. Needs his team to go in. And Ducky is going to get the memo. Knock up from Oath comes in, but you don't have the damage. No, he gets shredded. Dead. You get deleted. And now a great ultimate from Nog again helps turn away at least two members. And there's the execute to follow through. Slash barely any health to his name, but gets the job done. They turn that siege on its head. Lose the tier two, but they pick up two for themselves. Yeah, I'm going to be honest. I like the first call from the Hounds a little bit better, where they let the Titan go in and they just decided to go for the Primal Fury, but Neomot charges up the ult, the River of Sticks from downtown. Ducky goes in. Oath blinks as well. It seemed like they were all just grouped for that explosion, but Oath just didn't get the ultimate off in time or didn't get enough value from it, and a nice death scythe from Slash turns his HP bar immediately down. And now the Kowloon Wardens get time to try and build this gold lead in their favor, right? With Oath and Benny Q off the map, Primal Fury is going to be free. Take as much farm as you can. We may be looking at an Enhanced Fire Giant if this stalls out enough, and it's all going to be about keeping Nog safe. That was the issue before the last Fire Giant, right? Ducky gets both relics. Oath was able to get to the Kakulkan. That can't happen again. you got to be able to keep the divers out. 
and make sure that this ultimate is still available. If so, the Hounds play scared. They don't know if they can go in for a 50-50. Even with two Runic Bombs, you don't want to match with a full health Cuckoo, right? That ult can still be scary because of the knock-up and things like that. So uh, it's all going to be on Leon and Delany. Can they keep the Divers away? Can they keep Nog alive? And it's something, I mean, j even just to emphasize your point, and something J-Mac had mentioned on the desk, which was Nog stayed alive long enough to hit the ult. Did the whole ult 100 to 0 somebody? No. Did it get him low enough for Slash to come dunking down? Yes, that is the danger. The combination that they have. Slash got incredibly low, has to play carefully. Oath as well, someone who got caught out in the middle of the last fight. This is the loop around now. The question is going to be whether or not they can take this fight. Fire Giant's going to be spawning in. So the question, Shelly, is how they approach this and how they dissect this. Do you agree with them playing as, as not, I don't want to say passively, because they're definitely still aggressive. Oh my goodness. Maybe as far back, Delny eats a lot of damage in the process before they have to fall back. But do you agree with the, the Wardens playing as far back as they are? I mean, I think this is what they need you to remember. Stuart does not do Fire Giant quickly. They have the time to just wait for it to do a little bit more DPS. Delny can teleport back in. Fire Giant so low. Remember the last time the big issue was that Delny blinked in too early. Now they're just stalling. Let the Hounds take some damage. It's all a bait still. They're not going to commit with Nog here. They are not going to go for a 50-50. Fire Giant gets reset. This is exactly what you need to do. And Neomod did commit to that Gem of Isa. So this Caron is not going to be the tankiest man on the map. But he will annoy you. The, the shielding, the slows, all of that and more. And the Hounds stole away the... Oh, no, they got the Primates on this side. For some reason, I thought the Wardens made a pull there. <laughs> I'm just so used to seeing the Hounds steal it away. But they get a third Runic Bomb. Ducky has two in his pocket now. That's a lot of Runic Bombs. They are very much stacking the Confirm in their favor. All they have to do is bait out this Cuckoo ult. Whether it's a, a fake dive, a blink in, you know, Ducky goes into the Somersault Cloud, whatever it may be. Once Nog's ultimate goes down, the Hounds should have a free window to try and go for the FG. Well, and you can see Leon... I think maybe emphasizes most of what this team is looking for, which is finding the opener, right? Leon has been playing a little further forward, and there's only one reason a Maui's going to be that far up. He's looking for a landfall, he's looking for a hook. It just depends on how many people are on the other side of where he's looking. But he just hasn't been able to find that yet. And that's really the, the tug of war, it feels like, we've seen on this right-hand side. Hounds get a little aggressive, Warden's position themselves well and the hounds have to fall back same thing but vice versa it just seems like the teams like you said with the lack of burn on the fg and the amount of secure that the wardens have 50 50 is risky and it's just waiting for that other shoe to drop meanwhile i think i love what the wardens have been doing granted the gold lead is not necessarily diminishing by a whole ton because the hounds are doing the same but it's just kind of been like, oh, hey, this camp is up. Cool, let's go for it. Let's go push this minion wave up. A lot of control just around the, the lanes and the la around the jungle to make sure that they're in the best possible scenario. Just waiting for that big opener. But they're playing cautiously. And this is where the Hounds, Shelly, you had highlighted this earlier. They suffer a little bit. Yep. Because they don't have the same engage. They've got the the wave, and that's pretty much it to really start the fight. If I'm Benny Q, I'm going back to base, and I'm just stacking up as many lizards as possible in the left lane. He has one in mid and one in left. I'm putting, like, four different spawns in left lane because no one from the Hallen, or the McAllen Wardens is going to step forward. This fire giant bait is not working. They're not falling for it. Once it's EFG, there you go. The ring spawns in. This might be a little bit better. Just under half now, and here comes Benny Q with the zone. And as Leon gets aggressive, let's listen in with the Wardens as they take the fight. This, this oh. I'm coming back, I'm coming back. Okay, 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 okay. Nice, nice, nice. Can we come back? Come yeah. to me. I have Shell. We'll come in the back. I have Shell. I have Shell. Men, 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 men. She's one, she's one, she's one. Nice, nice, back, 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 back. Is this one, is this one, is this one? Look at Haim. Nice, nice, nice. Nice, nice. Cool, cool. So bad. Ducky, I'm pulling, I'm pulling. We have sentry? One sentry. We can't end the You hear exactly what you need to, Trelly. Clear, concise comms. First off, target calling, perfect. And it's something we've come to expect. You know, we talk about it a lot. You get to hear it there. Leon teams and Leon comms, right? If yep. you listen to Leon, the job gets done. And Slash gets a triple because of it. Seven, two, and four. They get the enhanced fire giant. They and got you a hear lot the call. They think they can end. And they've got 20 seconds before Neil, 30 before Benny. 
And just in the middle for Oath. So they're storming down the mid lane. Tier 1, gone. Tier 2, gone. Phoenix out of there. Now it's Stuart and Ducky versus the entirety of the Wardens trying to hold them off. But it's the Titan that is the main call. What they're looking for, the damage, seems to be bouncing a little bit back and forth. They take down Stu, but you've got the respawns coming through for the Hounds. It is not quite the Titan. You have to run away here if you are the Wardens, but you get so much done and only at a small cost of Slash. Yeah, that was going to be a rough one regardless. Those respawn timers were so close. Neilma up in six, and he has so much CC. And you got to make sure that that damage is connecting. It looks like they're going to have to go for the reset here. It was going to be a, a tight quarters play regardless at this point, Gore, but... If you win the FG fight so handily, you get the Enhanced Fire Giant. I can see where their confidence was. We heard it in their voice. Let's just step forward. Let's go in for the end call. It was just a, a lot of stall that comes through. That's what Wukong can provide as well. Going up into the Somersault Cloud, you got to kill him twice, and that can be very annoying to try and get done. The one thing, and you know, maybe I should have been watching this more, but the map state, I still feel like there's towers on oh, the yeah, side for lanes. Oh, yeah, for sure. And that's the other half of this conversation. We've seen this a lot where, where you know, you're confident, hey, we just, we've got... 25 seconds total before the big worry is back up, which in my mind is the Maman. And it's just enough time that maybe you could kill the Titan, but that, that couple hundred extra health that you get from the, the towers suddenly actually has to be applied into the equation. And something that they're not going to be able to deal with in that scenario, right? Knocked back, repelled out. But you got EFG still on four of the Wardens, a very favorable position, a brilliant team fight when they finally get in there. And with the way things are going, I mean, now you're, you're looking at the Hounds. Gold lead, we're laid enough in the game that maybe it's not that big of a deal. A lot of upgraded relics, things like that, are already on the board. And so they have to figure out, if you're the Hounds here, a better way to tackle this team fight. Because as of right now, the engage is non-existent. Yep, I mean, and also, you got to flip it as well for the Siege. Because that's what the Wardens have to deal with. You said side lanes still available, right? You got to push down left, you got to push down right. The base has not been fully broken yet. So, how much defense can the, the Eldritch Hounds even provide? Benny Q's got some decent clear. Stewart's been staying very safe, just by frosting out whenever trouble emerges. But you're going to have to stay on your ground and keep these birds alive, right? That's, mm -hmm. the, that's how you got to build yourself back up after you lose EFG like that. Whereas the Wardens, they can split up the map very well. Slash has been on point of, you know, if he gets into someone trouble, he goes into that hovering death and just sort of lingers. Says, hey, you guys getting anyone low? Can I execute? Or, or is that not a possibility? Should I just leave? That's what I want to see here from the Wardens. Are they going to split up? Are they just going to run as five? Probably the smart call with fire minions going down mid. You can push up left pretty consistently. Well, now they've got to do, again, a small reset to figure out where things are going to lie. You've got such a favorable position right now for the Wardens. In fact, I was talking gold lead. That might not even really be part of the equation against them anymore because they get that fury. And they put themselves up. Again, just a few hundred gold, but a few hundred gold nonetheless. That's going to bring us even in those regards, but EFG itself is going to help balance things out. You've got fire minions knocking down the mid, the mid Phoenix. And therefore, Shelly, you can start to put pressure elsewhere on the board. Do you want to see... The, the Wardens group up, go left, especially when Slash respawns, or is there another prime target? Could they go for, for an end and maybe try to pull the Hounds out of the base? The only issue I have with the full 5v5 grouping is that it does play into the Elder Town's hands, right? They want to be able to 5v5 with the Phoenix helping them out. A split push is usually your best option, especially with EFG, where, you know, Slash or Delny, just about anyone gets alone with a Phoenix and it's going to get soloed, right? That's what Enhanced Fire Giant can provide. The other issue is, if you're split up like that, and you're in a 3-2 split, and you reveal your, your hand too early, where like Leon, Tuba, and Nog all show themselves on left, you know for a fact the Hounds are going to sit around a corner in right lane and say, hey, there's only going to be two people walking up here. We can go for a quick gank, back immediately, and go and defend that left Phoenix, and nothing gets done. So that's probably why the Wardens are grouped up together in a 4 V1 at the moment, but Slash probably will just linger in the jungle to see if he can find anyone. The biggest thing uh, that you highlight is that separation, right? Like, yep. if it was a 3 2 split and two of them were in mid, that's not that big a deal. But you got to go to the other side of the map if you want to push down right lane and get the towers, get pressure on the Phoenix. Luckily, you've got an Oni minion wave over there doing the job for you. So they might not get the tower, but they're going to do a lot of damage and set you up for success while well, you can do, as you had mentioned, exactly this. Hide, hang out for 
and a half split, I guess you can call it, because he's not one, he's not in mid, he's just hanging out in the jungle. But the engage, as you mentioned, gonna be a little more troublesome. Delny goes in slow, massive onto a few, looks for the pull from Leon, but unable to find it. That's it. And it's going to completely quell that one, right where it is and right where it's at. Phoenix stays alive in the Hounds. Well, they keep breathing to see a few more minutes of gameplay. I didn't hate that engage either. Delny goes in, pops a Sentinel of Zeus, and then just puts up a shield and says, hey, you can't auto attack in. Come on, team. Walk up. But it seems like the Wardens didn't feel confident enough. They didn't love the engage. They weren't able to pull any relics with that landfall. So just back up. The, the siege is done. You got mid bird. You got left side tier two. And that's going to be it for the time being. The next enhanced fire giant is going to be the call. And it seems as if the Warden should feel aggressive enough to get some wards. That's that's the big deal once you get the first siege down, is you can go into the jungle, no problem, right? You're just going to walk in confidently, you got plenty of wards, and then you sit here and say, go ahead, how are you going to make it into the jungle? How are you going to make it to the Fire Giant Pit to actually de-ward when we have all this map space already covered? But good news for the Elder Challenge is that that mid-Phoenix will be spawning in here shortly, so they won't have to worry about the Fire Minions when the EFG spawns back in. Well, it's going to be, as you said, a little brief reprieve. Set up. Ward coverage. Probably going to be massive 3k pot for Nog in pocket. That's going to help secure tons of wards in pocket for the Hounds. And that's what I'm looking at right now. It's going to be vision around the FG pit in general. You've pushed up. You've got Tiamat. And therefore, you're going to be dealing with the fire minions in mid pretty easily. Unless the Wardens push them up heavily. The beacon to be captured if anybody truly wants it. But otherwise, Trelly, we are entering maybe unknown territory. Definitely territory where you cannot get caught out if you can avoid it. Hook is good on the ducky. The damage! Oh my god, the damage! Barely makes it on the Somersault Cloud, but that is an ult gone from the Hounds. And Nog looked like he wanted to chase a little bit further. The rest of the team wasn't there, and the Zephyr does not hit. Landfall tries to come out, tries to connect and pull, but won't quite get the separation. That it wanted, but the Wardens controlling the right side of the map and controlling the FG pit. Yep, EFG spawned in. The Wardens are trying to find something. Remember, they used a lot just to attempt to get those kills. Delmi jumps in just to try to put Neil Ma a little bit lower in HP. Threshold, that's what they're looking for. They want Slash to find and execute to start this fight out. So the tanks are going to be the target, but the Elder Towns aren't falling forward. They're not stepping forward, and they know EFG hasn't even been started up just yet. You have to be careful to Tuba's build. I mean, Deathbringer at this point finished for a while. That damage has been coming out, and it's been coming out true, and there's not a Spectral online on the Hound, so the crit is ringing where it needs to. Delny going for the zone. Rest of the team starts up the Fire Giant. They're Neomar up. backing up, and the Hounds have decided to let this one ride and see what they can do on the defense. Shelly, if they're going to trust their defense that much, I'm going to have to ask you if you trust their defense that much. Because they're going to need it against the EFG. I mean, that's the thing. If the if the Wardens re just rinse repeat the play they did last time and they were too scared to step forward, then I don't love it. But I feel like they should feel a bit more confident. They've got Polly on Nog. That Cuckoo is going to do you know, half that Phoenix's HP with the EFG. They don't have to play this one slow. They can walk forward, get the Phoenix, get out, reset, and continue to do so. And you can tell. That's what Nog's looking for. He wants to go in, get a Polly shot back up. Leon and Delny have to create the space for it to happen. I don't think the Elder Town should be able to defend this, but with how passive the Wardens are playing, it's not possible. We've got time. They're dancing on a ward, so Vision's going to be there for the house. They've got wards covering their entire base right now. They try to go in, try to shred the Phoenix, but again, a little bit of damage back at them. Not too much, but enough that they back away. Now Delny goes in deep. Nog with a deep shot, connects on to Neil, gets him low, but only takes him down to about half. Ducky up onto the Somersault Cloud. Has to make a decision. Is not going to go in here and instead falls back. Phoenix half health, but it's going to be a small reset for the Wardens by a little more time for the Hounds. Yep, that was the full engage. That's what they wanted. They found stun into ult. Didn't quite get Neil into threshold, which means Slash isn't going to go up into the ult. And you have to reset. All the while, not many auto attacks went into that Phoenix. Still a little under half health. Leon goes for the ult. Pulls back Benny Q. That's a huge pull. Benny tries to stay alive. That Aegis buys some time, but it only buys so much. Now Oath by themselves. Slash is up in the sky. Comes crashing back down. Mid Phoenix. Taken down by the Wardens. They have broken the base a second time. Now it is about getting the reset. Trying to find their way in. They've got a 4v5 advantage for the Wardens. Defense is going to be mounted. Left side Phoenix. But it's not going to be heavy. Instead, it's a few more autos, and that's all it takes. A second bird down. 
And the Warden's in an aggressive position. Start to sniff forward. They want one more pick before they go for the Titan. And Delny is going to lead the way. Slow him down. Stun. Double pick up from Leon. Now the ult. So oh, it's gone. Oh, thanks to Nog. And there's the Titan. There's the game. And the Warden's put themselves up 1-0. That's the cool quote we were looking for. They had the damage, they had the enhanced fire giant. Why not go for one more kill before you find the end call? Was a little bit slow, they got a little bit overconfident, but they always played it careful, and I think that's the big difference maker. They didn't just bite off more than they could chew and overextend. They didn't full wipe on a Titan Siege. They just lost one pick, backed up, tried again. This time around, were able to find their mark, and that's exactly what the Wardens need. This was a game that was in the Hound's favor until Nog hits a four-man cuckoo ult. <laughs> and since then, was a bit back and forth. But man, the Warden showed that that patience that you need to have, just waiting for someone to make a mistake. And we got to hear it in the comms for, for specifically the one Fire Giant. And, and, you know, Draft played, I think, heavily into a lot of that, where they never had to worry about the Hounds jumping into them in the FG pit. They, yep. The Hounds needed to worry about them. And they were just waiting for that right moment and then the right moment arrives. All of a sudden, you get the engage. We got to hear it in the comms. It was very precise and surgical as who is the target. Yep. When the Wardens get something like that, it sets them on the right path, and they find the at least the victory at the end of that road. Now, we have to see if they can do it a second time to keep on going. We'll figure out how that's all going to shake out right after this.
That's right, advanced.gg, our sponsor for Season X of the Smite Pro League. They've got brand new flavors, have had new flavors all year. The newest one, Cthulhu's Dream, Raspberry Acai, fantastic flavor. Use code SMITE for 10% off at advanced.gg on all of the Smite products. You can make sure that you're fueled up and ready to go as these players are fueled up and ready to go. I mean, you know that they're they're drinking some advanced CG in the booze. they I mean, got to have the energy. I mean, we got some. We got some of the little tubs just lying around. Oh here. yeah, you know, so they've got to be, you know, at least go in there, grab a little scoop for yourself. What, what was that code again? Uh, it's called Smite. Smite. How do I, now? How do I spell Smite? Because I'm illiterate. Okay, is it? I think it's. I don't. I don't know, man. You're putting me on the spot. I can't spell either. Oh well, good thing it's it's at least like written somewhere in the in the here. Surely S- it's on. Well, if you're watching us, you're either at twitch.tv slash smite game or youtube.com slash smite pro so it's right there in the url oh there you go so just use code smite was just it use temp- code smite for 10 percent off there to get you your advanced.gg products fantastic game one Cowlin wardens take that game number one in 38 minutes and jmac that one was a, a bit of a barn burner early on pretty close one but i think once we got to those fire giant fights they just looked so confident in the fights and that one listen in we heard i mean that tells the story of the game yeah, I, I think this one started a bit shaky for the Wardens. We look over at Oath, and he's running the field as Maman Brigitte, and that's to be expected. That's what Oath's kind of MO is, is, and that's how that god typically pilots. But the key factor is once this guy started getting in back, I- involved, once Nog started getting those ultimates through, and especially that one there, you don't even yeah. see it on the screen. It hits all four people of the Hounds. That was the turning point of the game, because that was a fight that the Hounds were just about to win. Walk up, maybe kill one or two more, walk away, go do a Fury for yourself. No, Nog says none of that. You want to hold hands inside of the jungle, you want to form a nice straight line. Well, I've got a big straight line that does a whole lot of damage at this level of the game. Hits four people with it, completely turns the tide, and then Slash is able to do exactly what Thanatos needs to. Gets in there and gets the cleanup kills. Death Sight slamming hard, executes hitting on point, or setting up for Nog or for the rest of his team to be able to really find those kind of closeouts there. And, and I think a lot of team fights, and, and this moment in particular when Elyon was able to find the solo pick onto Benny Q with that landfall, it is another moment where, where you kind of really can see the strength of this Callum Warden's team as a whole and the level of communication that Elyon is able to provide to this team. And I, I think a lot of fights were dictated on, is Nog here? Yes or no. Does he have ultimate? Yes or no. If it was yes to both of those, it was a pretty good fight for the Wardens. If either of those were a no, then it gets a little bit shakier for them. So having that heavy dependency on Nog to really be the brunt of the damage dealer isn't entirely ideal. But when he's able to line up shots like that, essentially free-handing ultimates all game and landing them, I'm not going to complain too much. So I, I think for the Elder Hounds, more than anything, adaptation moving into the next part of the set it is finding a way to get to this Kakulkan because they weren't able to get to Nog often. There was one team fight in about the mid-late game at around that 25 or so minute mark where the Elder Towns won a team fight because they killed Nog before the team fight started. He's dead, didn't have ultimate up yet. They found that pick and that's the best chance that the Elder Towns had at finding a win in that case. So if they can kill Nog, it makes these team fights so much easier for the Elder Towns. Yeah, I think especially... The, you're right that that whole formula of if cuckoo ultimate then win fight like that's a that's a good formula to have don't get me wrong but it's also i think slash goes off in, in a lot of those fights the thanatos ultimates didn't even need to get the execute in every single fight but just being that constant threat to start out the fight and then of course the maui ultimate constantly hitting those elion having the setup we got picks and mans for game number two here though and critically Elder Chounce, they, they lose out on that first game one, so they still have the pick on whether or not they want to go for that first pick slot or second pick. They opt to go into that first pick slot. Notably, that was where the Kowlin Wardens grabbed the Kukulkin in game number one. And I was going to say, I if I'm the Hounds in this position at first spot, I'm double banning Nog, at the very minimum double banning him, and that's what they do right here with a Thoth and a Kukulkin ban his way. Still plenty of other gods that Nog could go towards, but those are kind of the the two most simple, straightforward shot, aside from maybe like Raw throwing him into the mix there. So curious to see where Nog will now go with the remainder of his god pool. But the Kalan Warden is going for more support-oriented bands, taking away the Athena, the Sobek, Aphrodite, I imagine is around the corner because there are a few players in the league who, who do tend to, to swing towards that Aphrodite. Neil Ma's not typically one of them, but it's always a safe bet just banning a god as powerful as Aphrodite. If it doesn't get locked in here by the Eldritch Hounds and Aphrodite goes to the Kalan Wardens, I'm not going to chalk this up to GG, 
But again, that's Elyon's second god. It's technically probably his first one, but because of how often it's banned, he would have to default back towards the Maui. I don't want to see Elyon go to the Aphrodite in the sense of if you are a fan of the Elder Chowns and for how, how you know, wanting to see them continue and progress on, you don't want that Aphrodite to go and be the best pick that Elyon has acted to him. And when you listen into the player comms of that last game, it's exactly what we were calling for. Quick, concise, and loud communication coming from Elyon and the rest of the squad, making sure that they can rally around, saying, we need to go here, we need to push there, back up, do fire. That's the call. Tiamat is a fine pick, but I'm not a Tiamat first pick enthusiast by any stretch of the imagination. This feels almost like a dropped first pick and, and kind of first little slot here for the Elder Challenge. I mean, Tiamat's fine. BennyQ did fine on the pick. Right. But there are so many other picks that I would rather have seen drafted here, notably that Aphrodite taken away from Elyon. The Maman still on the, the Maman. table as well that they could have gone back to. I almost feel like they, they wanted this first pick slot because of the, the ban prowess, right? If you're in that first pick slot, you don't have to have maybe as many meta bans, so they get to take away the Kukulk and the Thanatos but they weren't necessarily ready for that first pick. They go ahead and go back to the team at, but you've been mentioning this Aphrodite. Sure enough, first picked for the Kowlin Warden should be going back into the hands of Elyon. And Hachiman was another one that was banned away by the Wardens in game number one. So they get two picks that were banned away in game number one. Sure, they lose some other picks. They lose to Kukulk and the, the, the Thanatos Delta figure out what they want to go back to there but I mean that is a strong dual lane combo to start off the draft the yeah, Aphrodite really kind of offset some of the early weaknesses of the Hachiman a little bit lower clear not the best boxing in early game no real self-sustain outside of getting something you know like a devourer's gauntlet to be able to be able to help himself out so Aphrodite helps keep the Hachiman alive gives him that extra bit of push and wave clear to keep that pressure up so I love the dual lane no absolutely zero complaints out of the Kalen Wardens my complaint for the Elder Challenge will come down to how does Benny Q perform on this TMI? You first pick this god. This is the one that you were willing to put all the marbles on, say that this is our priority. So now it puts more eyes on Benny Q. I wouldn't have even been upset if it was a Hachiman first pick. We saw that yesterday during some of the EU SCC teams kind of grabbing that one first, saying there's not a whole lot else out there that we really care that much about. So we'll just draft Hachiman because he's strong. I'm honestly surprised, and I'll say this in a more, I'm shocked as to how little priority there are. Where's the on hers? On her was the god to go to. And if you had an on her Afro duo lane, you essentially just ignored that lane if you were anybody against them. If you're the enemy jungler, you ignore that lane. You just walk entirely away from it and say, okay, cool. I give up. Congratulations, you've won duo lane. So I'm surprised we don't see any on her just yet. Maybe some of these players not as comfortable with it, especially seeing that Steward is willing to go back to the Heimdall. Again, not a high pressure god, just a safe clearing one in the duo lane. Leads me to believe that this Elder Towns team is building a bit more passive. Ratatoskr can get involved at that level 5 point, has great impact at the semi-global. But where is he going to go? Tiamat's not going to go for kills early. Sure, BennyQ can get aggressive, but BennyQ doesn't necessarily have kill pressure immediately out the gate. Same thing with the Heimdall. So, does this mean that Oath is going to be a little bit more passive in the jungle, just pay for a late game? I think that becomes determined as to what the two frontliners will be for the Elder Towns and seeing that both Yamoja and Ganesh are banned away, it leaves me wondering even where Neil Ma goes. The Charon did fine in game number one, but I'm still not huge and entirely sold on Charon just yet. I haven't seen that Charon guy just yet to, to really push it in this event so far. Right. Players that have made it work in the past have been like Hurry Win, Wrong You when we look back at the end of the phase matchup between the Ravens and the Leviathans. That made me a Charon believer then, but I'm not seeing it just now. The Tsukuyomi does give the Aphrodite somebody to stick to on the side of the Kalen Warden, so I do like having that potential carry in the late game. But we've also seen Tsukuyomi flex to multiple roles. We've seen solo, we've seen mid, we've seen jungle. So still a lot of ambiguity on the Kalen Wardens with that third pick. And I think we'll get a little bit more clarity after this next phase of picks really starts to roll through. Yeah, I think interesting to note, the Slash, as we've mentioned, was a solo laner before this, right? And I think he has had a, a good bit of success in the past on this Tsukiyomi, so could be something that he's looking to take into the jungle just for that comfort. And I think with this Nike locked in, I mean, still could go either way. We've seen Nike in the jungle and Slash has the history, right? So it, it could go either way, but I think more likely to see that Tsukiyomi in the jungle, especially when you do have that added safety, like you mentioned, attaching to the Aphrodite, you, you get to dive a little bit easier, but 
is an interesting hover here for the Hounds. We've got that Charon that they could go back to see if Neil Mock can have a little bit more success on that pick, but then the Odin being locked in. I'm, I'm immediately going to the other side. All four of those guys, actually Nike does have the lead, but the, the top three right there are completely trapped in the cage. I mean, Tsukiyomi can teleport to somebody with his ult, right? But outside of that, the cage could get some pretty good value here. I'm trying to find some extra synergy in the Hound's composition, but if these two gets get, these two gods get locked in, this feels almost like a fend for yourself style of composition where Neil Ma's going to be doing a lot of damage. He's going to be able to provide some CC, but he's not going to be there to peel for the team. Odin dropped the cage that seems like it's peel, but more than anything, you're going in to just trap enemy gods and try and set up for damage. There's not a whole lot of team-wide synergy that, that really pops in with those two selections added in there. I, I would like to see something to be one for a more offensive pressure and one for a more defensive. But right now, Ratatoskr, Karon, Odin, if these are the three, these are all offensive, which leads me to believe that this is more of a dive composition. But it's one that takes time to get online. Heimdall is going to be a little bit. Tiamat's going to take some time. Ratatoskr can kind of bridge that early mid to get to the late game. But with Karon and Odin, this really does feel like once they hit that level, that level 20 mark for everybody, once we hit kind of that 25 to 30 minute point of the game, they could effectively just run at the Kalen Wardens. And they, Odin is a great matchup into Aphrodite, into Hachiman, somewhat into Tsukuyomi because he has to use that Piercing Moonlight to get out of the cage, and, and same with uh, uh, Nike would be able to leap out. So it does kind of force the hand of the Wardens to pick something a bit more defensive for the mages, but leaving open the Baba Yaga that's being hovered here. So there is some play with the Odin. It's just kind of the classic counter matchup into Aphrodite. She can't break the cage open. Hachiman has to sit there and, and use his basic attacks for God knows how long to try and get that cage knocked down at that point. Does usually tend to force things like a Phantom Shell. But overall, this Elder Towns composition is one that really does scale so much later than some of these other team comps. The Nike's going to have immediate damage. Tsukiyomi, once he gets a couple items online, he's going to be hitting hard. The Aphrodite, once first defensive item comes online, you turn whoever you're attached to into a pseudo tank at that point. Just not seeing that that kill confirmation. And it was something that we saw lacking in some of the compositions yesterday. It's thinking immediately to, I believe it was that first game with the Guild of Gladiators where you picked this Ratatoskr jungle, but there was just no big burst damage to, to kill the frontliners, to kill the backliners or anything like that. So when you get that dive in, who's going to be your follow-up? Tiamat's going to take too long to get there. Heimdall, depending on his build, is going to take a bit of time, and it's all in in-hand damage. He has abilities, but they don't do a whole lot. So I think the Elder Towns, maybe their best composition lies in pick style of play. Get the Ratatoskr and the Odin together. They can bully somebody out if you can get Ratatoskr and a Heimdall somehow to the back line. You throw somebody out of the realms, and now you're in a 4v5 for at least a few seconds to try and get a pick. Uh, I think it's going to entirely come down to how they can play around more than anything, the Aphrodite ultimate. If that ult is online anytime that Heimdall or, or, or anytime that this Odin can get to the back line, even if the, this Ratatoskr gets there, if that Aphrodite ultimate is online, it's so much easier for the Kalen Wardens, and they have so much damage as well. Baba Yaga, yeah. Hachiman with those enhanced, even Tsukiyomi with that full ability style damage is just going to absolutely shred the Elder Town's composition. Yeah, that's that's my worry as well, is the difficulty to kill these Kalen Wardens players. Because I, I look at everybody, like, Baba Yaga presses four and, and immediately CC immune has a shield. Tsukiyomi is immune in the four and could be linked to Aphrodite, right? And then Nike has a huge shield. Hachiman has a horse that he can ride away on. And add all of that to whoever's linked to the Aphrodite. There's so much potential for safety here. Elder Towns have a little bit of it, right? I mean, they've gotten you know, maybe a little bit questioning on, on the peel. We don't have a traditional peel support over there in the Charon. But, I mean, a lot of safety in Heim, a lot of safety in, in Tiamat. And Tiamat off might, might want to go in, right? You mentioned it might be a dive comp. I mean, on the sides, Elder Towns maybe want to take this one later. If you're looking at the composition for the Wardens, where do they want to get online? Honestly, the Kalen Wardens can kind of play at any stage of the game. Tsukiyomi, well, mid lane probably not so much. Baba Yaga, not really great until you get at least three items online. Then she starts really hitting once that Book of Thought is stacked up, once you get that first, you know, first two pen items online. Then Baba Yaga is ready to play. Outside of that, the Kalen Wardens can kind of play just about any lane. Afro Hachiman is going to be able to play the early game very easily. Nike's going to have usually no issues in the soul lane. Against the Wukong, kind of a difficult matchup over there, but now up against something like an Odin, you don't care about Odin. You jump over his stun, you can jump over the bird bomb, you don't have to worry about any of that kind of damage out there. And then Tsukiyomi, you know, once Jotun's Wrath is online, hit that go button, just start running through. So Kalen Wardens kind of play at any stage of the game. 
but they just get better as the game goes on. Baba Yaga is a scaling god. Those potions start hitting for seven, eight, nine hundred late game once you toss those out. Yep. That Witchfire magic as well, just for that first ability. And then you just drop out the home sweet home. As you mentioned, you have that shield, you got that extra mobility, and you can just keep firing this constant raining fire damage. The Elder Towns, they want to try and end this one early, but this isn't really a comp to build, built for great early. Scaling is going to be big in this one. Game number two. Callan Wardens are going to close it out here. Elder Towns looking to even it up. We'll throw it over to our casters. Thanks so much, Frog and J-Mac. It's Gore, it's Trelly, and it's Doug for game two. And Trelly, an important game two at that. Because depending on how this shakes out, bracket-wise, it would mean the Hounds, if they lose this game, will be fighting against the Kings a little bit later today, and one of them would not make it to the World Championship. Guarantee us an SCC team going. But the Wardens have to win this one first to get there. That being said, they looked really good in moments that last game. But the early game was where they struggled the most. What kind of things do you think, especially now that they've swapped, right? Now you've got a Baba Yaga, you've got an Aphrodite. It definitely changes the way that their team fight is going to play, especially when you look at the other side as well, Ratatoskr, early game oriented, and the way Neil played that Chiron, or Charon. Yeah, there's a, there's a few things about both of these compositions that I like and dislike. N n n neither one is perfect by any means. You know, that there is the... The Kallen Wardens have a great late game if they're able to get there. That is, that is certainly the case. But the Sukuyomi Afro synergy, I'm not seeing it, man. The Suki is going to dive the back line, and that link is gone. You're the, like, there's no way Leon can keep up with the enemy team running away from the Sukuyomi, which means you're not going to have that immunity when you land unless he is like popping sprint, dropping a bracer, blinking in. Like It's, it's just not going to happen. And with that, you got to go look towards Ducky. Yeah, this cage can be fantastic, but what are you trapping in the cage with. Where's the follow-up? Is it Benny Q? The tornado is kind of nice. Is it Oath? Like the, I'm not seeing the big follow-up to the cage. So I see flaws in both of these compositions for sure. But it seems like just comfort picks, right? When 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 everything is on the line, go to what you know. I've got no problems with Oath on Rat. One of the hardest carry junglers you can get, especially just coming out of the gate early. The early game potential of Ratatoska can be insane. And Slash just likes the Sukuyomi. Not my favorite jungler by any stretch, but he just performed on Thanatos, who is very similar, and Ducky gets the solo kill on to Delny. Why is he stepping up for the totem? Uh, yeah, that's the biggest question. He was already incredibly low when yep. Ducky started the totem to stick around. Well, that's just impressive. I was just ready to say, well, we have something very similar to last game, where solo lane is getting incredibly low, and duo lane is getting incredibly low. Unfortunately for Delny, he gets a little too low, and now unfortunately for the duo lane, there's some aggression from Slash showing up over here. He wants Neil Ma, and they've got the three-man lockdown to do so. They're going to take the first blood for the Hounds, but the Wardens are going to tie it up just a few after. I mean, Delny, I'm still baffled about this solo kill because there's no way it needed to happen. No. You don't have to level 1-2. You, you 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 go one three and you just jump over the stun. You, you jump over the burp on. There is so much room for outplay here, but Delny goes one two, gets his two stunned out, and then he just loses so much damage. I don't see why he doesn't just level his jump. Maybe he loses too much pressure in lane, but surely it's better than getting soloed. Yeah, it's something that you got to be maybe more prepared for, right? Yep. I mean, in a moment. And Trelly, that's one of those moments where maybe he grabbed it just before realizing how low he was going to be around that totem. But now that lane, the last time it was kind of a tug of war. We'd go over there, Delny'd be low, but then Ducky'd be low, but then Delny'd be low. It'd be back and forth, right? But Delny never got blues last game, and it's going to be the same this game. Yeah, now yeah. it's going to be a rinse and repeat. And Slash is over here trying to do something. Oath is over here, though. And Oath has a solo laner right behind him to jump into the fight. Blue buff just now spawns in. He's Slash falls away. Delny is going to step up. And actually he secures got it. it. Oh my god, Delny manages to make sure he keeps his blue. And you know what, Shelly? He's I lied. Riding, riding just a little bit of the ship that's gone wrong. Yep, I lied. He will get a blue buff this time around. That's what I was worried about, <laughs> though, is Ducky showing up, Slash being like, don't worry, Delny, I will get your blue buff for you, and then ends up in a cage, and then you're putting your jungler behind as well. But doesn't happen. Delny gets to steal it. Slash didn't stick around for any sort of trouble, so that was lucky it ends up working out. I wouldn't be surprised if the pressure towards that blue buff does continue, but hey, getting the first respawn is its a good start, especially when you get first blooded yeah. like that. You're going to have a little bit of a deficit to try and match up to. Ducky is going to be stunning out a lot of your clear, which can be extremely annoying in this lane. But 
It's not going to be the end of the world. I do think that Slash should spend the majority of his time <laughs> elsewhere, though. This lane is not where you want to be ganking. I mean, Oath was on that blue buff pretty consistently last game. Yep. And admittedly, a lot of it was like after a little bit had a massive lead. Now you're on a god that can actually do something for the first few minutes, as opposed to the Maman. And so you have that that pressure. It's been going a little back and forth, though, in terms of farm. And that first Blood Downy maybe helping out a little bit. Now Nog up into the house. You've got Slash beside you. You need a little more damage to get something done, but here comes the knockup from Oath. The peel is going to be there. You need to help out Slash, who's getting low. Has to use the ult for some immunity, but can't quite escape. You're waiting for your cooldowns if you are Oath, and you the just peel. can't quite find it. My Nog. God. Nog making plays to save the jungler. What a great sequence for the Warden. I mean, first of all, Oath saves Benny Q 100%. Yes. Like, like, you are definitely just using the Piercing Moonlight to dive that TMI if you're a slash until you see the rat above you. But then Nog with the body block says, nope, nope, can't get hit, nope, not getting close. He just needed to connect like two of the acorns from Acorn Blast. And because Oath was so body blocked, he couldn't close the gap and could only hit one just to make sure that slash gets out there. Well played by the Baba Yaga. Man, Nog is putting on a show so far this set. I have been very enticed watching this man play and you gotta love plays like that. Yeah, the worst thing he's done Put a starter item in the second slot. Now that I've noticed it, it's just it's gonna stand out to me the entire so, time. So did Oath, man. It's no excuse. Yeah. You can sell the no acorn, all right? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> you can switch it up. That's all I'm saying. That's gonna yeah, you know what? We're we're grading. That's something that a lot of people don't know. We actually sit here with with clipboards yep. uh, and you know, score everybody. Right now, Ducky getting a 10 out of 10 for aggression. Might not be getting what he wants, though. Nox rotated over to help Delny. They're going to lose this blue buff. And unfortunately, without too much help, they're not going to find anything extra. Slash, though, attached to Leon. And they go deep, and I believe they actually just not only stripped away one of those, they might very easily get this purple buff and set themselves up for a little bit of success on the left-hand side of the map. Has been the call. Full-on retreat here, and that's what I love, though, when you know, and that's something the Wardens have been doing very well, is when they know that Oath is on the right side of the map, pressure the left, right? You know that Rat is at your your own solo laner's blue buff. Unfortunately, Nog makes the rotation over to try to help him out, gets the cage and says, hey, man, I tried. Like, you're, you're just not getting blue today. But they still pressure the left side of the map and put Stuart further behind. They are not just letting the pressure lie. You don't just get to invade over on right, and we get nothing for it. They are playing the map flawlessly, trying to, you know, equalize the pressure. Sure, you're going to get a little behind. This Nike is going to have some climbing to do, but Nog's level 9. You can see that Tuba's got a level lead. That's what the Wardens are trying to do. They're trying to equalize. That was what they did a great job of last game. Yep. They didn't equalize for a lot of time, and then in one big play, equalized the whole thing. This time, I, I, I think I like this approach a little bit better. <laughs> keep, it, keep it a lot closer than three, 4,000 gold. And make sure you don't fall too far behind. But it also means that we're in this awkward spot where we don't have too much for these teams to look for. Oath might be looking for Tuba. Has the ultimate. Has to be wary. Oath coming up just around him. Tuba completely unaware of the Ratatosker in his midst. Now should be able to spot him on the mini-map. Has to be careful. Needs the ult. Barely gets up to it and is able to get out of there, but how alive will you be when Rat comes dunking down, dodges it out, uses the beads, stays alive, and might even help wow. turn this one around. Slash gets the last hit and exactly what you need. Oath punished for his aggression. I mean, Oath saw Slash, right? Like, he was like, okay, there's a Suki here. At worst, I'm trading, and then didn't commit for the kill. That's what I don't understand. When you when you dive with the ult and then dash out, you are never going to get away from Piercing Moonlight. You just should commit for the kill there and maybe get a trade, but... Tried to run away, didn't end up working out, and Slash gets the freest kill of his life. And that was a great gank, too. I mean, Tuba could have immediately ulted, but instead he dashed, got it stunned, immediately beads into the ult, and now he's got nothing. Oath has the freest dive of his life if there's no Sukuyomi there. I mean, there's no dash, there's no beads, but Slash made the rotation over. Good sense of mind, good game sense, and for nothing. Oath doesn't even trade the kill there. That's demoralizing for the Elder Chance. And it keeps you... Not just in the neighborhood of where you need to be gold-wise, but actually slightly ahead if you're the Wardens. Unfortunately, that gets stripped away slightly by the blue buff Invade Oath. Has the cooldown on lock, is over there every single time, and poor Delny is suffering because of it. Two levels there, right? You've got a lead. You're doing really well if you're the Wardens, literally anywhere that's not solo lane, but that first blood, Trelly, it really has been 
punished time and time again. Even though it's not been stacking up in kills, it's the blue buff invades. It's the control that, that Oath and, and specifically Ducky have over here on the right lane. I mean, it's this. It's Ducky just walking up to the tower with no cares, no bothers. Because what's Delny going to do? He's just going to die if he tries to take the fight. That's the thing. I mean, Ducky is going to be a problem, but I said this at the beginning of the game. I'm not seeing the value from the Odin. I get it that he's going to trap, you know, Slash, and he's going to trap Eleon and, and Tuba. But you got to think about the damage in the cage. That's what I want to see. Where's the follow-up? And it's going to be Benny Q, and it's yeah. going to be Stuart. But Stuart's so far behind, it's going to take him a while to get there. So you're pretty much hoping that Benny Q's got the follow-up. I guess Neilma, he can throw a wave, right? That's going to set it up pretty well. It's not as if Odin is only a cage, though. That's something that I want to bring up as well. Odin's damage is, is sneaky annoying. The, the, the slows, the stuns, that can all set up very well. Point being, Ducky's going to have to, to bring a lot to the table here to try and bring the, the left side of his map back into the game because at the moment, Leon and Tuba are just trying to take a Tier 1 tower. They've got no fears in the world. And looking at the minimap, they don't really have a reason to. Nobody's over on this side of the map to help Stuart out. So if you've got the pressure, might as well use it. Leon's going to back to base. And we haven't gotten to see too much out of the Aphrodite. We really haven't seen anything out of the, the Chiron. Or the Charon. I'm going to keep doing that. Man. <laughs> the Charon either. Neither have been super aggressive. Last time around, you know, one of the things we talked about was Neil. It really just entirely for the Hounds. The engage wasn't really there. Do you think, so first off, Oath levels that out pretty well. We might get to see some of that here. Some engage. Mini Q jumps in. The wave comes through. Slash. Piercing Moonlight hits a few and great knockup, great control, and maybe a good amount of damage coming out from the Wardens. Not enough to find a kill, but enough to turn the fight back in their favor. Knockback from Leon. The and now they have what no. they need. Oh my god, the silence from Nog lines it up the way you need. And they punish Mini Q for the aggression, and they turn the fight. The Hounds started. The Hounds fought and sought and turned on its head and now they get to go for a gold fear that is ridiculous man it's just luck too that silence destroyed ben he didn't have beads he couldn't jump he couldn't use any of his abilities and it was on the perfect path that he was trying to take gold fear getting low oath neil and stewart are here but they're playing zone to do the warrants don't want this now you have to be a little careful though we've seen how easily this can get taken away and that's with a cuckoo on the board what are they going to do it's getting low ducky comes in kills a few of the hounds they're just going to be able to pick that one up but no, the warrants get it get it oh my god what is it the tuba drops the the banner that is able to secure it despite everything going wrong in the moment. At least Tuba has the saving grace, keeps his team ahead. I mean, that's what I said. Ducky needs to show up big for his team, and that's exactly what he does. He has a massive lead. He upgrades Teleport Del, and he says, Boys, good luck. There is no way I'm making it to that fight. I'm just going to, you know, try and catch back up. Ducky gets about as much as you could ask for, right? A two man cage stops the Gold Fury in its tracks, destroys just about everyone. And Tuba says, are you guys really going to hold this while I'm still here? Oh, thanks. Heavenly Banner, I'm out. So it ends up still being okay for the Wardens, but this Odin is a growing problem, man. They, they, you cannot let Ducky sneak up on you like that. The teleport needs to be called out immediately. Like, hey, guys, I don't have TP. Good luck. He could show up. It was a, it was a bit of a vision thing, I think, that the Wardens really messed up there. But luckily, Tuba ends up making it not a total wash. Well, first speaking of the game, Hounds have... Pretty much the entire control. It doesn't look like the Wardens are too worried about putting up a defense around that one. It is still two levels. You had mentioned Delny staying around to, to farm up, and I was excited for him for a moment because it was 13 to 12. Now Ducky's ticked back over to 14, keeping it about the same distance it has been. It might get a little bit worse, actually. Oath is coming over here with Ducky. What are they going to try to accomplish? Can Delny escape? Good leap, but good stun. Cage lockdown after the jump means Delny's going to have to eat the breath of this good what? dodge. Good oh. juke. He's dancing around, has him under the tower, and is turning this around. Could have even potentially chased for a kill. I thought he was going to. Meanwhile, his team picks up Neil in mid. I mean, it's going right for the Wardens in the best ways and wrong for the Hounds in the worst of ways. Yeah, if I'm Delny, you know what? He is behind. It was a smart call to not go in, but I probably would have tried to chase that. Oh, yeah, I, I, tunnel vision and, 100%. And I, I would have ended up dying, likely, but still. The fact that Oath missed it, I thought that he was going to end up tanking the tower there. Luckily, Ducky was able to make sure that didn't happen. But if Oath did take tower aggro, he was 100% dying. That could have been extremely rough. Nah goes into the ultimate here just to get some good damage and also stack up more of that Baba passive while the ult's channeled. And look at this. Delny gets a blue buff. All, all things are right for the Wardens. They're having a great old time, whereas the Hounds, 
They need to go back to the drawing board with some of these ganks. Yeah, they've got decent damage. Slash did end up using the beads there, but Stewart shows up and says, hey, no more chasing. No more chasing. One thing I'm curious about, we actually might get to see a live replay of it. I was going to say if Neil gets caught out. But watching what Nog was able to do, because this is, again, it's huge when you have your solo lane staying alive and you're able to get this under the tower, Chelly, uh, which just goes to show the amount of damage and, and I think control the Wardens are exerting on the map. But th this Baba, you know, I've come to, to think of Baba more and more, right, as, as late game, right? She can show up here, and Nog doesn't seem to be hitting any bumps in the road. I mean, it, it feels like it's been smooth sailing the whole time. Yep, there's been no problem so far, and that's going to be exactly what you're looking for. You want the fast track to late game with the Baba Yaga. You want that prophetic cloak online as quickly as possible, and that's exactly what we see being built here from the Baba in mid. No, something to note, though, Stewart has been able to catch back up, and not just catch back up, have the level lead, and has been bullying out Tuba a little bit. That's the benefit of the Heimdall. You have that extra le level of safety. You don't really have to worry about ganks, but now that Stewart's got that dominance online, feels more confident to step up and actually take some of these auto attack trades. So I, I wouldn't mind seeing a bit of a 1v1 over in, in duo lane just to see if they've got the, you know, the damage to outplay each other. But there's a lot more Wardens over on left than yeah. there are rounds. A lot more than just the one. And luckily for Stu, that is just the right distance. That was good. If it was any shorter, maybe causes some trouble. Well, yeah, you call it Pyro, loud and clear, and scooped up slow, slow rolling for the Hounds. They have to be careful. Hounds are going to get free. it. I saw Nog that was over there, but now the Fury on the other side. No Maybe you could make the rotation. Oath could go up into the sky. This could not be as easy for the Wardens as they think, but it will be. Just because Oath may be unawares that it's going on at the time or not willing to risk his life for it. So it goes objective for objective and a small neutral camp as well towards the Wardens. Yeah, but the Wardens, they stay so grouped, Gora. I mean, constantly three-man death squatting over to left lane, over to mid. No one heading over to Ducky, really. But besides that, always staying together. And now we see a little bit of a rotation. Is this a three-man for the blue buff? Ducky's by himself, but Ducky can't die at this point. I just cannot see this Odin getting burned through for quite some time. Maybe if Tuba rotated in, it would be a little bit easier, but yeah, there's not a fear in the world for this Odin. <laughs> Ducky just has plenty of shielding going on. He's going to be in no sort of threat, but I like this. When you know that the Wardens are over and right, what does Oath do? He comes left, looks towards the purple buff. Tuba might have to just go in for a steal, because yeah, trying to fight this doesn't seem smart. He manages to dodge out the stun. So you got to be careful how long you overstay this, plus the damage. Between Stu. Purple buff started up. It's going to be a move forward. Ult actually used by Tuba. Has Leon coming around and feels like they could do a little bit more. You've got Slash in the jungle. If Oath comes back in, this is going to be dangerous for him. Loop around comes for Slash. They're both Link here. is not online. He's gone Beads and Aegis for the Tsukiyomi. So if you're going to find a kill, you're going to have to do it the old-fashioned way. Piercing Moonlight is a long ability, though. Unfortunately, he's not able to get within range. and Instead, it's going to be a simple back. And the pressure from the Hounds gets thwarted by great rotations from the Wardens. Yeah, this seemed too risky. Stewart had Aegis there, both relics available. No teleport, but really wouldn't have mattered. I don't think a level 14 Suki had the damage to get through a Heimdall at this stage with both relics. So probably the smart call, just a retreat. And Stewart gets a little bit of follow-up here from Neil Ma. But again, Tuba has been playing very safe so far on this Hachiman, whether it's been from that one gank that Oath sent his way underneath the tower or just, you know, throughout the entirety of this match has just been chilling, right? You don't want to step up too far. You don't want to use mounted archery unless you know for a fact that you can survive until it's back up. And that's exactly what we see. Duba just chilling until that cooldown's back. But they traded objective score. It was a pyro for, for a primal, both down at the moment. Beacon is here, but the Wardens seem to have the aggressive positioning towards it as Neil and Leon keep going back and forth. But look at the level disparity. Leon's got three levels on Neil. He's just sitting back, stacking up cloaks and Thebes. Whereas Leon's got his third item online already. And honestly, feels like it's the Thieves that really makes it stand out. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's one thing where you can say just Afro things or, you know what, Neil's doing Neil things, right? He's going to fall behind a little bit. But when you've got the full Thieves versus just now Neil Ma finishing his, that is a big difference. And they're going to get aggressive. Oath forced up into the sky. He's going to go back in for the knockup. They've got another advantage in the 
meantime, especially with Binky rotating in, you need a big knockup. Gonna look for it on the back of the wave. Comes crashing down, but now it's 4v4. You need the damage. You got good healing. Slash has to be careful. Nog coming in for the loop around, but you've lost your jungler in the meantime. Ability smacks onto Stuart, but not able to quite get the damage necessary. Tuba forced to ult to get away, and Ducky, as you said, doing exactly what he needs to. It's not dying as he chases down the Wardens. Creates a ton of space for his team and manages to make that a 1-0 trade in favor of the Hounds. Yeah, these are going to be the fights that change the game in the Hounds' favor. The ones where Ducky shows up first and it's just an unkillable machine. That is exactly what this Odin is bringing to the table. Uh, the cage didn't get much value, right? It was just instantly shelled and just sprinted away, but it didn't really matter. It wasn't the cage. It was Ducky chasing down and now Fire Giant started up. Delny, Leon, the only ones in range, but Nog isn't too far off and Neomoth's getting very low. This could be risky. Fire Giant, like you said, half Neil forced to dash away. Luckily, as we've come accustomed to seeing, Caron can swim, or at least row, incredibly quickly. And so he's going to be out of there. Fire Giant dropped. Fury, Primal, Pyro, I should say, back up on the board. So a couple of neutral objectives available. Trelly, I mean, this is about as even of a game as you could have, right? Where we're still around, what, 1,500-ish gold, and, and even then, that's not been very consistent for the Wardens. Kills are 4-4. Four to four. And outside of some level disparities, which you're mainly seeing in support, although Neil has done a great job catching back up after that last fight, it is virtually a line in the middle. And now as we start to round the 20-minute mark, plays around these objectives are going to be punished a little bit harder. We've seen, you know, pick up the Gold Fury in favor of the, the losing the Pyromancer trades, you know, for both teams. But now it's where their aggression goes and how they manage to handle this. And as we like to point out where the carries go. Right now, they're still on left. Well, that can be an incredibly telling portion of this game. And now I've got to ask you the one that's been making me scratch my head. How do, I, how do you deal with Ducky? Well, that's the thing. This is what I wanted to bring to attention. Ducky's last gang was at the perfect time because Nog had just finished Prophetic Cloak, and he just got a full Obsidian Shard off that back. Now he's got Pen. That's a little bit different. Look at Tuba, about to finish the XC or the Kins, right? He's about to hit some power spikes as well to help deal with these tankier targets. When Ducky rotated, there was no damage for him. Now, you see that extra level of pen, maybe a Soul Reaver on the horizon. There are ways to deal with the Odin. The Wardens just didn't have them yet. Now, they're building in towards them. So Ducky's going to be, you know, th the boss of the map for a little bit longer. But once Tuba finishes that item, and once Nog actually gets a damage check, we might see a little bit more going to that HP bar, but look at this. Oath is sitting in the back. Tier 1 tower is the target here for the Hounds, but I'm not sure Delny even wants to step up at this point. Just, just if, if the Elder Towns aren't committing to Pyromancer or to the tower, just let Tuba get solo farm, but that's not the case. Oath blinks in. Now Tuba back, reset. Good CC immediately onto Oath, but they haven't pulled the ult and they haven't made Oath feel uncomfortable. Bead's still there. ADQ takes a lot of damage in the meantime, though. Ducky, once again, doing a lot of the zoning. Nog takes a lot of the poke. Delny goes in. Slow is massive, but you need the follow-up. The same thing can be said for Ducky's cage. Not quite enough to smack anybody down. Wave from Neil. Connects on two. Matrelli, everybody walks away. Really just a little bit worse on relics or ults. Yeah, so far. But the Wardens haven't quite left yet. The Hounds are trying to reset as well. So both of these objectives are going to stand tall for the time being. Man, that was just back and forth, just peeling for each other, right? Benny Q starts to take a ton of damage from Nog, so he goes into the ultimate, Benny Q runs. Then, in the ultimate, Nog thinks he's free casting, and Stuart just starts pumping auto attacks into the home sweet home. Immediately, Nog has to bail. Ducky dropped the cage more so just to peel and try and set up for his squad, and then Neil sends out the cage. So, wasn't a terrible fight by any means, but I think both teams are just, you know, doing a bit of a damage check here, trying to figure out exactly where their strengths lie. And Ducky is still a, a big threat. The Kins is online for Tuba. The Ob Shard is online for Nog. But I'm thinking one more damage item or the upgraded starter items at least before you feel confident trying to shred through this Odin. Yeah, it's going to be necessary. I mean, at this point, like I feel like most of the fights that have gone wrong for the Wardens have been, oh, Ducky showed up and Ducky walked down four. Therefore... Yep. You couldn't fight anymore. Everybody had to back off. Especially, I didn't even see how what happened to Nog, but so much damage. It was just Stuart free casting on the house. Yeah, throwing too much towards him. That's not something you can let happen. Luckily, beads down for 80 seconds on Stu. Maybe an opportunity. Good grouping from the Wardens on right. Should be a pyro pull. 
The secure in this game is not as easily done as last time. They might look for a little bit more. Great stun from Oath. Good little dash. Make sure that A, Pyromancer doesn't go down, but B, he doesn't lose his life or his beads either. And that is... Charlie, the waters we're treading right now. But with Nog, Delny backing to base. Delny teleporting over towards right. Pyro pulled and should be secured pretty easily by the Hounds. We'll see if that stays true. Yeah, Slash and crew. A little too late on the response. So finally an objective goes down. It's a small advantage, but the double runic bomb for Oath is a huge, huge asset to have in the pocket. He doesn't want a ward so bad. He could have let anyone take that bomb. He said, no, nah, let, let, let me get both of them. Trust me, it's better on me. He just doesn't want to buy wards. And I can understand that. He just wants to, you know, get as much damage as possible. The Wardens pick up a free Gold Fury. That's not going to be too big of an issue because the Titans are pushing up mid lane and the Elder Towns are in an aggressive position to try and take this Tier 1 tower. As long as they deal with this Chaos Titan quickly, they should be able to at least grab the Tier 1 for free. Remember, with those double Runic Bombs, Oath oh, could drop them at any given moment. The Wardens are here, though. They're ready to put up a solid defense. Well, the Titan's going down. Hounds are going to go in with Ducky starting this. Let's listen in with the team. What, 90, 90, 90, yep, 90. Nice, attacking. Patient, 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 patient. Back up together. Stay we're together. Still good, we're still good. Yeah, Titan yeah, now, Titan It's now. honestly really I'm good, tanking. so I think. Silent Afro, Tudor. I'm tanking, I'm tanking. Sure, sure. Do you have a stun? Do you have a stun? No, no, no. How long are you? One second on patience. 30 seconds on cage. Okay. Holding stun now, stunning Suki. Yeah. I have cooldown, man. I have cool so MVP, beads, Suki nice beads. patience. Slow. Can we keep playing it? I have yes, a bomb. Yes, yes, yes. Just play off James yeah, though, okay? Play this way, play this next way. Play yeah, this way. play off James here. Patience, James. How long, Cage? Uh, where's here? Where's here? Bracer 15 on 15 seconds, stunning upper. Silencer, two-winger. Nice. Really okay. good, really good. Patience now. Tower now, I'm tower now. I'm looking at yeah, tower now. Oh, yeah. mm. no, no, I'm it's back, too far, it's too far. Yeah, tower I want to reset. I'm backing up. I'm going to drop my wards, I'm going to reset, okay? You know, we talked about it a lot a few years ago, and we always talk about it because Neil uh, is very vocal. I feel like the difference between what we just heard, Trelly, and what we were hearing like two months ago when Neil, especially like with all your sights. Knock up from Delny, not going to connect as much as they want, but they've separated Stu from the rest of the team. Here comes the piercing moonlight damage is there, and you manage to get Oath at the last hit, so you fall back and get out of there. Now you need a little more damage if you want to find the lockdown. No kills just yet, but a huge amount of resets forced from the Hounds, and it should be an open fire giant pit, but you're going to have to deal with response at some point. Stu, half health, Spots Delny, and Delny's backing, should have teleport. Ducky, speaking of teleport, comes into the back, has the fire giant on his eyes and on his mind. Comes in and is looking for CC, looking for damage, looking for something. Warden's got but he it. just can't find it. Wardens, get this FG. They're going And ahead. now they're going to go for a little bit more. They burned down Stu, and with Ducky half health, they might look at the fight afterwards. Slash, trying to find it. They don't have the ults to chase him down, though, Trelly. The Wardens are going to hit the pause button for a moment, reset, and then use this FG to its full potential. I mean, that was huge, right? Ducky goes in, and that's the benefit of this Phantom Shell. Everyone always says when you're up against Odin, you know, you can out class the shell and that's true Odin gets one cage backs up then you fight for a second time and the shit and the cage gets massive value but what do the wardens say hey now there's no cage let's fight right now let's not <laughs> wait for the cage to get back up let's force everything because Ducky has just used his best tool whereas Delny goes to the back line gets a five man slow essentially and then jumps in and gets the knock up slash gets a very lucky I think the piercing moonlight if he goes to anyone but oath could have been trouble, but because he went to Oath, he didn't dive into four members of the Hounds. He was able to reset with his team. They didn't find any picks, but what they did do is get everyone so weak that no one except for Stuart could even be a vision towards that Fire Giant. And even with the teleport in, it was very low odds. Ducky didn't have a Runic Bomb. Oath grabbed two, so th there's no way you go in for the steal there. 
I think if Ducky has one, maybe he can make a play, but it's still very low odds. I like to see his presence, but like you said, only so much you can do. And that's honestly impressive, because based on the comms we heard from the Hounds just a little bit before, you don't have a huge window for Ducky's ult while it's down. And he's calling 30 seconds when the diamond was a fourth of the way full, so you have to be really precise if you're the Wardens to be able to operate in that window. But they get the job done, they get the Fire Giant. Reset, they get the Pyro, they get the Gold Fury, and now they get to run down left looking towards the Tier 2. I see a couple of Hounds mounting a defense here. Soft defense, hard defense. How hard can they, they sustain around this Tier 2? I bet you Ducky blinks in, goes for the cage, gets the Phantom Shell, and resets. That's probably the call here. But with Relic Dagger, Leon does not care. He has the cooldown back up when the team wants to fight, and it looks like they're going to play this one slow. Send out those TMO Tornadoes, throw out you know, your ranged poke. But eventually, this tower should go down unless Oath wants to go in for an ultimate. He's playing very far back here. There's the blink forward, but it's Delny who goes in. He's the ult, gets a massive slow. It only keeps him under control for a little bit. Tier 2 was the main target, though, and that's exactly what the Wardens get. And now, Charlie, a little more systematic than they were last game. Last game, they win a massive fight and can just run down mid to really kind of get the blood pumping and, and specifically knock down a Phoenix. This time, it's Tier 2 and left. Just back, reset, realize that your minion wave in mid is all the way back at your own Tier 2 and maybe having to fall back a little further than you would have anticipated. And so slowing things down, Fire Giant only up for a little over a minute now for them to play with. Two Tier 2s still standing. Do you like this kind of scatter to the winds and farm approach they're taking, or do you think they could have grouped up and pushed for a little more? I mean, man, those waves were just so pushed up. They wanted to go in for that Tier 2, but it was all the way essentially to their Phoenix at that point. So the Wardens really did have to go back, clear up some waves. At that point, everyone's like, I've got a lot of gold in hand. Like, like Tuba's got 3k, he still hasn't backed. Is it worth it to go in for a push right now? Look at the lead that the Wardens have, and then remove 8,000, and now they're behind. And that's how much gold is currently in their hand, right? They just backed and spent it all, so. Yeah, full Deathbringer, by the way. <laughs> yeah, full Deathbringer. I mean, Soul Reavers are online, Stone of like, there's just a lot, or the Erosion, rather. There was a lot that was just purchased there, so I don't hate the idea of playing this one safe. That shows confidence. The Wardens don't think they needed that Fire Giant to, to win the game in one foul swoop, but look at this wraparound. I don't know if there's any vision, vision to catch this out. If anything, they might have a good go to the back line. That's a jump in from Delny. Now potentially looking for the ult, try to find the massive slow. Instead holds onto it. Oath up into the sky. It's a separated fight. Delny's on his own. Oath comes crashing down onto the solo laner. That's going to be a leap away. Nike manages to stay alive, barely, but gets out of there. Now Ducky leap forward. No cage dropped because it was already used, already shelled, and already not finding too much to do. The Wardens taking a lot of poke now with Nog leading the forefront of all things. Take more damage than maybe necessary. The Minotaur chasing you down. Tiamat trying to get the last couple of hits. And Trelly, despite low health bars all across the board, nobody goes down in that fight. A lot of relics used, ults used. But everyone gets to back to the base and reset. I got to say, that's a great time for the Wardens to just outright lose a fight because EFG isn't here yet, right? If it was, you're almost certainly losing the Enhanced Fire Giant just by nature of only your tanks were able to stick around. But the relic situation isn't looking great either. You pull Nog's beads. Both relics for Leon are going to be down, but they should be back up before a scrap. Actually, if it's just the beads from Nog, that's not terrible. As long as you have Home Sweet Home back up, you should have all the CC immunity you really need. How often is this Baba Yaga getting stunned, especially because that was off a blink from Oath? He should be just fine in about 10 seconds. So that's not the end of the world, and now it's going to be on the Hounds. And I brought this up last game, but Stuart once again doesn't go into crit. This Fire Giant is not going to go down very quickly. It's going to take a while. If the Wardens just want to sit back and wait, they can certainly do that. And this Pyro may be a prime example of it. It's lower health. The Wardens just get to walk in and take it when the Hounds got it down to one-third HP because they don't have to worry about it. Stu, like you said, a little slow on the burn. Great for killing tanks. Oh, yeah. Not too hot around these neutral objectives. And right now, that's what the Wardens are controlling, and that's where their lead has been found. Charlie, about 7,000 gold. They're going to continue to try and push the limit in the jungle. They hang around the FG. But I don't see them going for the engage just yet. And a lot of this relies on Ducky, it feels like. Has the blink, has the cage. You had already highlighted it, though. Leon has the shell. And as long as you're grouped up, you're going to be just fine. So the Hounds take the pit. 
But how confident, I mean, we just saw with a Pyromancer, you can't really start the FG with the Hounds with a hope of actually taking. You need to win the fight. No, I don't hate this at all from the Wardens. They they really should let the Hounds tank this up because, again, they're not going to burn it quickly. Their burst isn't fantastic. Leon has two Runic Bombs, and they have Afro Heal. If, if the, I'm getting so mad deja vu from game one. If the Hounds, <laughs> yeah, if, if, if the Hounds want to commit, they have to look for a fight, and that's what happens. Ducky blinks in, goes for the cage, finds it, but Phantom Shell wasn't even used. They didn't care. Yeah, they didn't need it. Now you've got the Shell to hold on to. In fact, you can get a Aggressive Ducky's already taken half his health, and now you've got the full team healing up. Delny leading the way, still has ult, goes for the slow onto Stu, who has the ult to get away. Knock Benny up onto Benny, one more shot, alternate timeline buys him some time, but it's not going to get the job done and keep him around. Now Neoma, next up on the chopping block, taken down Oath, is looking for the split push to try and balance things out, will go and will succeed in getting this Phoenix. It's just going to be the Phoenix, and it's going to be a trade for your team and for this enhanced fire giant, but Oath making a proactive play, opening up a win condition for his team. They're not done. It looks like a 1v1 happened between Delany and Oath. Probably one Oath doesn't love, but Ducky and Stu walking up to the fire giant. The Kalen Wardens have to decide, are we 50 50 or are we killing Stuart with the Bifrost out? you probably go back for the FG. Now you still have to worry about Ducky. And Oath actually has ult. If Oath gets into a good spot, could ult in mid come over, look for the knockup, and try to go for the steal? So. Eyes on Runic Bombs in Leon's pocket. Eyes on Ducky. Eyes on Oath. Who's going to go in and where's this Fire Giant going to go? It's getting low already. You need a couple more hits. No one's up in the sky. No one's going for it. Wardens get the EFG. Slash with a good zone, but Slash in a little bit of danger. Needs the ult from Leon, and it's beautifully timed, beautifully played. Keeps them alive. Forces the Hounds to fall back and keeps all five of the Wardens with the EFG. Not to mention, that's both Stuart's relics. He had the Beads and Aegis to survive. That's Tsukuyomi ult, so now he might be in some trouble once the dive actually continues. Sure, he used a Phantom Shell and an Afro ult to make sure that Slash survived that as well, but those are cooldowns you can wait for. The, the, the Kowloon Wardens can go in off their own aggression whenever they'd like, whereas the Hounds, they don't have a choice. They have to sit there underneath their Phoenix and just wait and hope that the Relics are back up at that point. Oni Fury get some enhanced minions rolling in, gonna be a big win as well. Sure, mid Phoenix is down, but just push up mid. Go, go for mid Phoenix first. Not gonna be the end of the world when you have enhanced Fire Giant, those Fire Minions. Not going to be that big of a deal. Yeah, it's a lot easier this time, right? Last time, you know, a little over a minute with the Fire Giant by the time they take it to mid, and, and you have to play it slow. The minions aren't there. There's a whole lot. You don't have to worry about the minions now. <laughs> you can play a lot more uh, to your own style if you're the Wardens. They're still going to push up mid, though. Have an Oni minion wave coming to help them out, as well as Oni minions on right and left pushing out for them to give them a small advantage when they start to rotate over towards those. With the Tier 2, this should be pretty easy. Now, Charlie, we've got to talk about Phoenix defense. Normally, we can talk about, you know, massive mage abilities, but the Tiamat, while it's been hitting pretty hard, hasn't gotten as much done so far uh, that maybe Benny Q would have liked. Yeah, this is one of those picks that I think was just a, a comfort pick for Benny Q. Not going to be top of the meta by any stretch, but it was safe. It was something they could grab early on in the draft. And early, early. You got it yeah, first. Yeah, but... <laughs> I don't think that it's going to be the best in this situation. Your alternate timeline's down for 200 seconds. The tornado is fantastic under defense. The CC, the damage is annoying. But it's a pretty long cooldown. Once that gets faded out, you don't bring much to the tape. We'll have to watch. Keep your eyes on Benny Hughes' damage. Maybe keep your eyes on that Phoenix. Oh, my God. Burned down in the blink of an eye. Oath. Waiting around the corner, looking for Nog. Doesn't find the stun. Immediately falls back. And it's a five-man grouping from the Wardens. I mean, you had called it. 20 minutes ago that they were walking around as a three-man death ball. Now it's just a five-man death ball. And it feels like they have plenty of control. They're going to skip over mid-Phoenix for now. There's a fire wave going to their yeah, Titan. That's kind of cool. right into their base. Maybe not what you would want. It got Maybe. split up. Their Titan can handle it. Yeah, okay. They'll be fine. They'll be fine. The question is how well they can siege this Phoenix. On the right-hand side, they topple the Tier 2. Do they go in? Well, Delny marches yeah, in like it's nothing. He has no worries whatsoever. Might need to use the ult to survive, though. A lot of burn comes down from the Hounds. Phoenix halfway down already. Wave from Neil. It's only going to clip two who are affected by it. And now it's a march forward from the Wardens. Again, the Phoenix is the main goal. They get that. They're going to back away just fine. And Shelly, advantage. Two birds down on the Hounds. The Wardens are doing maybe a small victory lap as they run through the jungle. I, admittedly, it's because they only have a minute left on the Fire Giant need to reset. And they need to save that mid bird. That Phoenix would drop down if someone doesn't go clear the wave quickly, so probably smart. They all retreated immediately. It was close, but that bird will not drop one more time. 
And now I'm thinking, how do the Wardens want to play this? Last time they went in for just the all-in once they felt confident, once they found their pick. Could be the idea here, but you don't really have many openings. The relics on the side of the Hounds aren't down because they didn't really fight. It was more of a, okay, we, we shredded through Delany, that was great, but we couldn't keep the bird alive. And I do want to call to reason that that is what Stuart built for, right? He is absolutely melting this Nike. It's just how many times you get to free cast on the Nike. Nog did a great job of just going into home sweet home and just throwing firebolts and saying, hey, back up. You know, like, give, give us space. Hey, let, man, stop. Yeah, let, <laughs> let us hit the Phoenix, bro. I'm going to keep throwing fire at your feet until you move. And that's what happened. Now they've got two openings. You got Stuart over and left and Benny Q over and right clearing out the waves. The Wardens don't have EFG, so they are going to have to play this slow, you'd think. But actually, they're just in the jungle. They're waiting to see if they can find a pick. They might be able to. I mean, look, Oath, Benny, both in an awkward spot that if there's not a lot of communication going on, <laughs> you might get caught out. Luckily, it seems like both of them caught wind of it in time and were able to move away, but that hasn't slowed the Wardens down. They're not backing up to set up for the Fire Giant. They're setting up for the Phoenix. It's still going to be a lot more precarious than the last two, right? No EFG, that Phoenix, especially with Delny getting burned as quick as he did with the EFG. Yeah, you're not going to take that risk. Instead, once again, back to the jungle. Look for the picks. Miss the CC on the Oath because of the dash. Now you've got Ducky. You've got the wave. The Hounds, they want to take this fight, and they're bringing it to the Wardens as best they can. Unfortunately, their best just isn't getting it done. Oh, my God, the damage, too. Immediately taken out. Synced timers there for Neil and Benny Q, and now the Wardens can surge forward with a lot more confidence. Oath running back down mid, has to channel the back, but you're going to lose this third Phoenix. you got fire minions in the right-hand lane. It all comes down to this for your defense. What can you do without Stu? It's not going to be a whole lot. Oath back into the fountain, tries to do his best with his Titan. It's fallen too hard, and the Wardens knock down an SPL team and move themselves to a world qualifying match. And this was what I was worried about, Gore. I spoke about it very early on. Sure, Ducky was able to get fed massive in lane, but how many cages do we just see ignored late game? That Phantom Shell is still up right now. The game's over. It's still available. He hit massive cages. It just didn't matter because what were they trapped in with? There was no damage. There wasn't the follow-up. This Odin pick was massive to get them to the early game, but the carries had to step up to try and bridge that gap. And unfortunately, Venny Q and Stuart were pretty dealt with. The dive from this squad, from the Wardens, was ridiculous. Uh, and that last fight shows that maybe the best they did that it could have, right? You get Neil and Benny Q all in one big smack if you're yep. the Wardens. And that's enough to just knock down the door. I mean, they kicked it open with those two kills. And as a few fights, it feels like, started that way for them. Get them into a good position. Again, Shelly, if we're, we're going grand scheme, right? That's not the end of the road for them. They still have another match, right? It's double Elam. But if you're thinking of bracket-wise, the Wardens are now up against the Scarabs <laughs> to try and qualify. Like, we're guaranteed an SCC team going to Worlds right. from this group. We're also guaranteed an SPL team getting eliminated today from this group. And that's because the Wardens played so well in that game. Yeah, and that's what you got to bring to your next matchups, right? Confidence. When you get a win Energy. like this, a 2-0 win at that, you better carry it to your next matchup. You better stand tall. And I think that's exactly what the Wardens are going to do. Yeah. And they looked good at doing it so far. Now they can stand maybe even a little taller. But that's going to do it for myself and Shelly. We'll go over to the desk and they can break the rest down. Callan Wardens take a clean sweep, a 2-0 up against the SBL team. The Hounds fall down to the loser's side of the bracket, Wardens up to the winner's side of the bracket. And like Gore said, that means that an SPL team is getting eliminated later today. Yeah, having an SPL team go out on day number two of the event inside the group, not the best feeling, especially when it's another SPL team that's going to be knocking them down. But got to give props to the Warden. I got to give a lot of props to Elyon, too. Communications yep. this entire set have been so clean for his team, allowing them to really be able to get to these late game team fights, to really be able to dictate the pacings of these fights in general. And, and I think they broke it down really well over there at the, at the very end of the cast, saying that Ducky was a great start for this team for the Eldritch Challenge. Getting a few kills onto Ducky, really difficult to kill in the late game. But once we started hitting kind of that 25 to 30 minute mark, we looked at Ducky's build, said, okay, well, what else can he go for that six slot? We look up six, seven minutes later, and he's still not finishing that item because the Hounds aren't able to get anything going on the map. He's investing all of his relics, or all of his gold into relics, I should say. But there's nothing going for the fight. And the biggest question mark that needed, or I should say the biggest question that needed to be answered was who's going to deal with with Nog, who's killing the Baba Yaga on the side of the Hounds? The answer to that was nobody. The best chance they had of killing Nog is if Nog was diving into their backline trying to kill them instead. I mean, we saw how much damage Benny Q was able to do, 
but he's only able to hit that on the frontliners. Delny soaks up so much damage during those team fights. Dives into the Phoenix, stands in front of Stewart. Dives into another Phoenix, stands in front of Benny Q. Allows his carries to be able to kill these Phoenixes. And then Delny's able to back up, reset with teleport. Elyon on the Aphrodite, able to heal the team back up. 18,000 healing, by the way. And again, that's against an Odin, against the amount of anti-heal that was built. I mean, there was a Divine Ruin. There was the Cage from the Yodin. There, there's so many ways to be able to try and answer up against that Afro. But then Trelly breaks it down the best. The last three, four team fights that we saw Ducky drop this Odin Cage, the Wardens ignored it. Yeah, Ducky's catching one at best, maybe two people in, in the cages during these fights. And because of that, it's like, okay, well, we can just, you know, knock the wall down, no problem. Or, hey, we'll just stand in here because it's not doing a whole lot of damage to us. So when you have that Odin that got the early but can't trench this into the late game, when you have an unkillable mid laner on the other side of the Baba Yaga who also built the Prophetic, which is something that's been the staple on that god for a brief stint, we saw none of the Prophetic, but it's already back in its full swing. If you can't kill Nog, and, and damn, I, I feel like we just said that in game one. If you kill Nog, it makes it a lot easier, but they couldn't so kill weird. Nog. And it was so much that easier for the Wardens. Yeah, I feel like they should they, they should have killed the mid laner. Killed Nog. It's easy, I right? Don't... Easier said than done, e I guess. Easier said than done, indeed. Callan Wardens, clean sweep, 2-0. We've got Tuba standing by for an interview with Gore. That's right, I got Tuba standing by. And it's awesome. I mean, been a blast. I can feel the energy, right? Obviously coming from you and the rest of the team. That's a massive win. And, and up front, I just want to know, how does it feel? Bro. <laughs> so for whoever's been following us, like at the beginning of SCC, we had a lot of roster changes. People had to go home because my team was mostly people who moved to Mexico to play. So we had a lot of last minute changes, two roll swaps. Obviously, Slash and Andy, they're, they're crazy players. They roll swap. They just took out an SPL team who's been playing for all year or longer. I mean, how does it not feel good, you know? And the thing is, is like, it was really interesting when we started this set. I think a lot of people coming into this, right, with based on where the Hounds have been, kind of 50 50. They were like, I don't know. Actually, when we looked at the Twitch poll, it was. It was the first one, I think, in their favor, second time around, came to, to y'all. But, you know, game one as well really started to skew gold-wise and everything towards the Hounds. And then it comes down to, like, one huge team fight around a Gold Fury where Nog hits and also, like, what is that turnaround like? Like, what was the mentality, especially after, like, 15 minutes of, of falling behind, to really get back into that game? Um, I mean, as soon as we fell behind around back camps, we liked our comp. Like, that was the comp that, like, we feel like we can scale with, right? So we we're like, okay, we'll scale late game, and then I mean, gone. You saw what he did. He's just a game changer. He hit his all, and then uh, from there we're like, okay, we know how to win from here. This is what we do, and we just took over. Got the job done, and then of course that moves us to game two, where for a long time we, were, you know, we were talking about it, but like it felt like, okay, if Ducky shows up, he can push four back, and then eventually that stopped happening. A lot of that was like your damage coming through, being able to just like slam people around. So what was it going for a more, I guess, close game, right? Still dragged out a little bit, right? Had to get some EFGs to get the job done. Lose a Phoenix a couple of times. Some fights aren't there. But, like, what is game two's mentality like the whole way through? Um, I mean, it just felt, it felt, I mean, obviously it felt easier, right? Because we weren't behind 5,000, 6,000 gold. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, we were just looking for stuff first. They were playing reactive, right? Or they're having, like, silly ults. So, I mean, we felt confident. We felt like we had them on the back. We felt like we were more allowed to do what we want to do, and they were playing more like, I guess, scared might be the word. I don't want to say scared, but less calculated, you know, because, I mean, it's a tournament. Everyone's trying to win. And the good news, when everyone's trying to win, is that you did win, right? 2-0 yeah. here, so you get to move forward. Of course, we're going to get to see you again tomorrow. Best of fives when it starts. A World's Qualifier match. It's going to be uh, impressive, but congratulations once again, man. Thanks for your time, and we'll throw it back to the desk. You hear it there from Tuba cool and calculated. I mean, especially game two, you get, and this is what we've been talking about, the communication. You bring Slash online, you bring Ellie on to this team, and they just feel like they have a game plan just all, all, all the time to go forward, and that's so important when you hear the comms, when you hear the confidence coming out. We can take a look at the bracket for these squads. We've already seen every team at this point. We can take a look at Group B first and see where those teams just went to Callan Wardens. In the bottom left side, they take this set 2-0. First, the Eldritch Hounds. That's going to set us up for an elimination best of three. Camelot Kings, Eldritch Hounds. That'll be our last match of today, so make sure you stick around for that one. On the other side of the bracket, though, we've got our other four teams. You've seen everybody play at this point, but we've got another elimination match on the horizon. And that's our two losers from yesterday. Balba Storm versus the Gilded Gladiators coming up next, and that's still, I mean, 
we could get two SPL teams knocked out today. I mean, being all honest, there's a potential we could see two or three SCC teams potentially take it to Worlds. I think right now, out of the teams from the SPL that have played, the Highland Ravens have looked the cleanest. I think Hex Mambo is going to be a very difficult matchup for them in that qualifier match. I think this Gilded Gladiators versus Shibaba Storm might be closer than some teams and some people out there are, are really thinking, especially after the performance kind of both these teams have had over it. But I also kind of want to just go back real quick to what Tubo was saying about the roster change. I want